Thank you so uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Health Care and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee on Friday, 22nd of July 2022. I'm Councillor Lisa Swinghurst and I chair this committee. Uh, for those present in the meeting room, if the fire alarm sounds, please leave the building by the nearest exit, make your way to the fire assembly point in the car park. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Heritage Council website. The Council is streaming this meeting live on the Heritage Council YouTube channel and is making a recording. To ensure that recording quality is maintained, please speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum. Please ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silence. Others are permitted to film, photograph and record public meetings, provided that it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. Only committee members present in the meeting room may vote. We have a number of people in attendance as virtual participants. Can I request that they use the raise hand function within the system if they wish to contribute and to introduce themselves when they are called upon? Thank you. So I will start with agenda item one. Apologies for absence. No apologies have been received from committee members to date. Uh, apologies have been received from Councillor Crockett, Cabinet Member Health and Allen Wellbeing, and Christine Price, Chief Officer, Herefordshire Health Watch. And uh, agenda item number two, named substitutes. No substitutes have been identified. Agenda item number three, declarations of interest. Do any members wish to declare any schedule one, schedule two, or other interest in any agenda item? Thank you, that's a no. Uh, agenda item number four, questions from members of the public. No questions have been received from members of the public on this occasion. Agenda item number five, questions from members of the council. No questions have been received from members of the council. Agenda item number six, role and objectives of the Health, Care and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. Sorry, Councillor Marsh. Councillor Marsh has failed to grasp which, um, which one I should attach myself to because I haven't got it in my arrow. I think that I couldn't join them. So Mr. Coleman's coming to assist. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I sit here as uh, vice chair of this committee. Um, for purposes of one aspect of this, which is the task and finish group, my uh, I have listed my interests in farming farming related matters. Uh, they are a matter, as I say, a record. But just for the sake of clarity, I just want to express that now. Thank you, Councillor Jinman. Thank you. Any other interests? Right. Thank you. So we'll go on to uh, agenda item, item number six. It's not on my go. My go. I'm sorry, Councillor Summers. My go. It's, it's not on my go. It's, it's me. Yes, it is. It's yeah. under a new heading, which is health care and well being scrutiny committee. The committee chair has changed its name uh, since okay. the last meeting. Okay. okay, so we'll move on to uh, agenda item number six, the role and objectives of the Health Care and Wellbeing Student Committee. And uh, I'm going to invite Michael Carr, the interim statutory scrutiny officer, to introduce this item, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, brief item. Um, since this is the debut meeting of the Health Care and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee, the first meeting, uh, members are asked to note the role and remits of the CPT set out uh, as approved by Council and is set out in paragraph 15 of the report. Also, as circulated, there are 12 objectives which reflect the scrutiny function in the statute and the constitution screening process and the developmental objectives so the very broad objectives and the screening management board on the 16th of june they set objectives for themselves and it was agreed in principle to encourage the screening committees to similarly set out some overall objectives around those key 
um, key processes. And they are in brief the functions of the committee being uh, objectives around policy development to make an impact on policy development in the Shia, um, to include and deliver reports from the committee, similarly to improve powers of making recommendations to the executive, to consider how committees can be clearly evidence-based and making evidence-based recommendations for the report's sake, being clearer about that. Being clearer about the expectation of an executive response for recommendations. So it's making sure that the decision maker gives that to the actual decision that are made so that we can make to make the impact. Um, another key statutory function Objectives on holding the executive to account, sometimes called critical planning challenge. But this is a key function of the committee. So being able to be here to just to demonstrate that, obviously do that, clear care about it, demonstrate something that you can say that we've done that effectively. Also, objectives on scrutiny of partnerships and external organizations. So just to remind the committee, scrutiny committees have the remit of looking outside the council and can build, can add value by building the partnerships of all the partners come together and we get evidence from external organisations. And in some cases, deliver some degree of accountability for external organisations by questioning them as well. There's objectives around questions in committees. So it's, again, it's not that the screening committees are not doing this uh, on the day effectively all the time, but to make sure that we're effective, because there's a key function of screening committees and what they do is question people, question organizations, question the executive. Two main planks to that is questions about accountability, holding to account can be different to the kind of questions when we're looking for evidence and support that so that's the key objective around that. Um, objectives on work planning, which obviously the committee has already been undertaking sessions in work planning to make them more evidence based on the public outside of the committee. Objectives on task and finish groups to make sure that the, uh, they are effective and their outcomes have quality reports. And finally, but not least, an objective around the public and remembering the public. Elected councils championing the public, committee holding the public as witnesses uh, and engaging the public through the post. So they're, they're fairly broad strategic objectives, uh, but they're all relevant to the development of the street function in the So I think they will be useful, but bear in mind as we go through the rest of the new municipal year. That's it. Thanks very much. Uh... Thanks, Martha. I, I've got a couple of just sort of points for clarification on the um, covering report uh, 6C, which is about the role of the scrutiny management board, deciding which of the committees will consider whether a spotlight task mm -hmm. or initial standing panel review is appropriate. So just, just for my own clarification, it's the role of the scrutiny management board to determine which of the constituent committees can consider a task and finish. Uh, am I reading that right? Chair, yeah. so my understanding of this, which is the reading that's set out in the Constitution to be by Council, is that's a functional role of the Screening Management Board in negotiation. So uh, I don't think that it takes away the powers of the committees to establish its own task and finish groups or its own work. But there may be areas where there are overlaps, uh, maybe duplication. And because all of the uh, chairs of the, 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 the screening committees are on the screening management board, hopefully the screening management board can play that strategic management function in resolving those to make, make it effective. I think that's the intention behind it. Okay, that's that, that's reassuring. Thank you. Um, so, Councillor yes, Just to raise a point on that. I've already been approached by one of the other groups to provide or to engage with a task and finish group that's coming out of another committee. 
um, it seems to be that cross fertilization needs to be encouraged. And but as you rightly said, ownership of the end product needs to be clearly established in those terms. And it, it, if seconded on or just been taken as a counselor, um, establishing who's running what does need to be clarified. And I think that goes back to that board uh, to do. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I can see uh, two chairmen uh, back to back, 15 paces with a suitable weapon. <laughs> 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 So just, just to follow up on councillor's favourite point, so the task and finish groups are a vehicle where the committees can involve other people outside the committees, other councillors, uh, and indeed co-optees where appropriate. Um, but at the end of the day, they bring back to work the formal committees and the committees have to take ownership of those because these are the constituted committees. Thank you. So, see, this will probably be a it's a relationship that, that, that's developing, mm -hmm. and um, I'll see how it goes. But there's a uh, there's a good point well made. Let me spoil it. Hi. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, all I was going to say is just in terms of the, the actual constitution, um, that part of our um, specifically said in the three minutes management board that where a matter falls within the remit of one or more street committees decide which committee will consider it and whether a spotlight task and finish or standing panel review is appropriate. So I think probably the emphasis on where it covers a broad area perhaps um, rather than mm. rather than stepping on toes as it were. Yeah, so it just lost a little something in the compression yeah. necessary yeah. for the report covering. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Gandhi. Yeah, I, I I think the wording of the um, particular paragraph is very misleading because it it tends to give the impression that before a committee can undertake a spotlight task and finish or a standing panel review, that the management board has to agree whether it is appropriate for them to do so. So, for example. The one that we are looking at today, if we've had this in place previously, um, it gives the impression that we would have to have gone to the standard of the scrutiny management board first to say, is it okay to have a TNA on intensive culture units? Yes or no. And if it is, is it appropriate for our committee to look at it? Or do you want someone else to look at it? Which, in some respects, if that's, that's the way it reads, that may not be what is meant. That's the way it reads. If, but if that is what they are, it means, that takes a lot of um, opportunities away from committees to be able to determine the, their own um, task and finish groups um, and without then almost like permission to do so from, from a, a higher body. And I, I find that not terribly democratic from the point of view of scrutiny. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Gandhi. And I think that was sort of my uh, mm. my concern as Carl said that the, specifically the compression of the, the idea for the report has made that uh, more ambiguous than it should be. Um, having said that, I think it, it probably the relationship between the scrutiny management board and the scrutiny committees is, is something that will have to develop over time. But certainly, I don't think the scrutiny committees are going to cede their rights to choose to do spotlight or task and finish uh, to a uh, management board. But we don't know. So, yes, as, as I said previously, just to clarify that. Uh, there's no uh, sense in which the screen mental board is taking any powers away from the screen committees to undertake their work. This is a, there's a provision, I think, there to allow the screen management board where there are overlaps or there's say, say for example, there's a matter which falls within two committees, you know, which one should take that? And that it can be resolved at the screen yeah. management board. Yeah, the, the, the screen committee certainly can undertake their own work as they see fit. I think, I think there's a further rather important point here is that. Sometimes it's not been totally clear that a scrutiny uh, or any other group has actually formed a particular grouping to look at something. It's not been the easiest to actually find who's done what from where. If the coordination is done for this, it should be that they will have a full list 
of every of every uh, standing committee, every panel, every uh, grouping, etc. And I think that would actually almost would be extremely helpful, not just to council members, but to the public trying to understand what is being looked at and by who. <coughs> Um, yes, and in, in, a, in the same vein, um, can I assume, uh, again from this slightly ambiguous wording, that we will still have scrutiny of our own budget? Because there are, at least, there are two references there about uh, budget scrutiny within the management board. Um, but will we still be scrutinizing the individual budgets for the, the director? And I mean, it's certainly coming up in the management, board, but it's also within the scope of this committee um, budget and on the lines. Look at oh, paragraph 15, which you. Um, uh, out of the community budget and policy framework, which is a sort of catch all for everything. Yeah. Um, so, we, we, as I understand it, it would be within our scope to scrutinize the budget. It may not be that we have to do it, but we could choose to do it. Is that correct? Uh, um, if, if I may, I, I believe the intention is that the Street Management Board. Um, Streamlines the budget. Um, the, the yes, indeed. The, the, at the moment, the constitution does say the budget policy framework um, for the director of the act. That's actually come out of the other scrutiny committees, which suggests that perhaps framework policy framework items might have should have said that they didn't have a budget. Perhaps should have admitted. I don't know, but we'll have to clarify that. But I think I think at the moment this discussion is about how the budget is going to be handled through scrutiny management board anyway. So clearly, we'll see clarification from for all members on that. Okay, so if. If we accept this uh, today, then, but we, we, we're accepting it with that as a possible not insignificant amendment. Uh, well, at the moment, the, the Constitution specifies the Street Management Board um, that remit is the budget. Okay, so this it shouldn't say budget at number 15. Again, that's a constitutional matter, so we have to get that changed in the Constitution. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but so, so we'll, we'll make sure we get clarification. To okay. Thank you. Councilor I think we might be overanalyzing scrutiny management board. It seems pretty straightforward to me. Uh, there's a member of the chair for each scrutiny is on this board. And that all that all it's going to do is allow us to know what is coming up in the future and see if there's any crossovers. That's what the management board comes in. So I think we're overcomplicating it. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I don't think we should hammer it to death, quite frankly, and get on with the, the rest of the stuff that we're getting on with. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Noted it was uh, what's good advice from Councillor Summers. Councillor Lodge. Six and six. No. Um, I, I personally feel that it would be a great loss if the scrutiny committees don't look at budgets. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. in this year, particularly, there are likely to be extreme budget pressures, yeah. and there will be horrible choices to be made. And it seems to me that the scrutiny committee. Are in a strong position to go, okay, of this X million that is having to be cut here. I, I, I personally, I, I would much prefer to see that out more widely rather than everyone else going, well, it was them that said it, you know, with the scrutiny management board. So I remember last year there was some concern in this committee because as it turned out, we got rather rather scant details of the budget, uh, although we were still able to make some helpful remarks. But personally, I feel that is one of the areas where, as I say, especially when we expect strong budget pressures, that the scrutiny committees would be um, playing vital roles. So personally, if we have managed to smuggle our and budget through, I, would, I wouldn't be in any hurry to delete it. <laughs> Yes, I was going to say, so this is one of those areas, possibly, uh, where there are obvious overlaps at the budget, and it's important to be affected uh, in two respects. One is that each of the different areas of uh, the council and the units of different committees are included, but also the scrutiny budget is joined up because there's, there's two things which have to be resolved. So I was just going to point out that there is a report going to the scrutiny management board 
uh, in September, 5th September, and that will include consideration of how the budget will be. Screening will be conducted. So I think there's a really valid point which uh, I think the screening management will certainly it will be proposed as a lead on the budget since it's in the least term to reference, but to make sure that whatever happens, there is an inclusive approach. That's what I would suggest, but it will be up to members to do it. Given the savings target, so arguably, you know. I can quite see the you know the big picture, but there will always be some granularity further down where personally I will wait with interest to see how it plays out. But I mean the I think the thing I mean I agree I agree with Trish entirely um because I recognise that the Chair of, the, of each scrutiny committee will be sitting on the board. It doesn't re necessarily represent, unless they've discussed it with the committee, mm -hmm. does not necessarily represent the views of the, of the committee on the budget mm -hmm. for their particular area. So somehow or other, there has to be some dialogue between the chair of this particular scrutiny committee with the members of this particular scrutiny committee to ascertain what the view is of them of the proposed budget for her to feed back to the board um, because this is not about you know the chair's the chair's view of the budget this is the chair representing this scrutiny committee's view of the budget so there must be somewhere we, we must be able to get mm. somewhere the opportunity to consider the budget otherwise i don't know quite how Lisa, without a few telephone calls and private emails is going to actually get the views of our committee on what we feel about the budget. I mean, the whole point of this <laughs> government's review was to spread involvement of councillors and, 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 and a, a greater diversity of opinion and make sure everybody was involved. It strikes me yeah. that if we were to go down that route, and I, I understand, I hear what's being said, that it may be not way, we're almost setting up another cabinet yeah. made up of scrutiny chairs who well, could unilaterally, without consulting their committees, um, decide what the priorities should or shouldn't be. Okay, uh, I think that's fine, and hopefully we've captured that really important discussion. So, the um, the recommendation is that the general role and remit of the scrutiny committee be noted. I think we're comfortable with that, and the healthcare and wellbeing scrutiny committee objectives for 2022-23 be agreed. So that is as written, and I think we're all comfortable with that. Yep, those in favour? Any against? Oh, so everyone's good with that. Um, we've got any, any, any further to add? Can I, can I go slightly off piece to you? Go on then. <laughs> and I know you always indulge me. Um, so this isn't the agenda item it's actually the bit before the agenda item the guide to the committee which prefaces the same um i just wanted to just i'm sure it's fine but under section g uh, g1 um to secure improvement in the physical and mental health of the people of england now this is of no ward interest to me at all but i i think the chair and the vice chair and possibly councillor gandhi might thank me but you know there are times when we have to discuss the implications of uh, the welsh health service and the cross mm -hmm. the cross border yeah. services that we share um can i assume that we're not sort of tying our hands in in that respect yeah so page 10 g1 when it, it's under the guide of what this committee does mm. it is quite specific about the physical and mental health of the people of england um i just mm. want just wonder if we do have to mention those people across the border occasionally and or, are we slightly yeah we have got a whole ward that's Group gets there because well, it's still resident in England. I mean, I think that maybe that's just a clarification. 
Yeah, no, I was just it just it just but then what do we do about what yeah. out the page? Hmm. Well actually if you read the bit above, it says um in this regard, health servicing health services include services designed to secure improvement in the physical and mental health of people of England. Somewhere we need Mr. Uh, so I was just going to point out that so the, the scrutiny arrangements uh, in legislation are different to England and Wales, well, so it probably just reflects the uh, uh, view of where we England. Mm. That's why we're referencing the English uh, legislation. Well, so it's always yeah. good to raise these points yeah. of mm. cross border complications because they, they do occur again and again. Ports keep that in focus. Yeah, so, so sort of actually factually sometimes the health provision in Wales would affect the physical and mental health of the people of England because they're using it. So I suppose in a way that if you're being you know generous, you could say that it that doesn't they would be included. Yes. Although we would have absolutely no no, no um, management of them, but it is nevertheless true that if the Welsh services improved and our, it improved our physical and mental health, we would be able to, I suppose, comment on it. But there also comes down to sometimes, you know, in terms of issues with capacity of the hospital, the number of patients in Wales who are coming across to use the hospital is an important component. Um, I'm not sure that there's, a, there's an easy answer. No, Thank you for raising it. Okay, so I'd like to move on to uh, the next agenda item, uh, just uh, number seven, which is the Health Care and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee Annual Work Plan. Uh, so, thanks, and I invite Michael Carr to introduce this item. Yes, uh, so councillors will be aware that we have considered informally the uh, topics going forward for each of the scrutiny committees and taken advice from the departments and other councillors in that process. And um, indeed, the previous years were for uh, the adults and social care scrutiny committee. Uh, the, the draft work programme for the rest of the school year is now presented to you for agreement and worked out around them. Can I just check, are we still streaming? We're still streaming, <clears throat> okay. but um, we are being forced to do an update, um, which is outside of our control, so we may just need to take a brief recess if that would be okay with Chair. Yes, that's fine, we'll take a brief recess at this point. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm having a brief recess. Um, obviously, um, the dates for the next meetings were agreed, presumably between the chair and officers. I
Hello, so the uh, the screening committee will be aware that uh, there has been some consultation on the uh, possible topics for the, the screening committee's work programs in June, consulting with members of the um, department, and other, other members of other committees, and these uh, priority topics that the uh, committee members have selected have been worked out around the committee timetable for the year and worked out in a table in the appendix to this report, which you're now asked to agree. And that will inform the report requests and the agenda planning for the rest of the year, including any external witnesses and planning for the screening outcomes. So it allows for greater transparency and planning for your work. Um, and so you're, if you're invited to, to agree that plan, you may wish to just ask uh, members of the committee and, and attending officers if they have a view before you, you do so. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Um, I just going to make a comment on the item for the 23rd of January, which is um, includes within it the, the, the very issue that Councillor Tillett raised mm -hmm. earlier about uh, mm -hmm. cross border um, access. And uh, whilst you know, clearly the thrust of this work is about community provision. Though I am aware that the CCG had drafted a cross-border protocol, and I'm also aware that we've never really looked at that. Um, and it would be useful as a background document here, because then we, we can sort of triangulate to that, and that may indeed form the basis of something that we would take on at a later date, potentially. Um, so if that's possible, if we could contact the CCG, I don't, I don't, don't really any more than just whatever that current draft looks like, or hopefully it's not a draft anymore, and that would be really helpful. Um, and I had also uh, emailed, because I'd, I'd become aware of this change to the ambulance service. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's really early days, but I think I want that on a reserve list or sort of something, a watching brief list um, to, to be aware that there are substantial changes going on at the moment, if that's okay. Um, so do any other committee members want are to... You, are you specifically talking about the 111? No, the ambulance service. The ambulance service, because there's also mm -hmm. changed with the 111, isn't there? Right, well, that, that's, yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of changes in the... And that's the mm -hmm. measure. I think it's more in the... Can we use the... So, I, I think that's more in the... Because there was a... Um, a longish article on the um, see back to tell you checks, whatever you want to call it, on BBC mm -hmm. News this morning. 
about the thing, mm-hmm. in which case we'll, we'll put that on the watching brief as well and probably look for an opportunity to bring that in well, at some point. Thank you, Councillor Marsh. Yeah, I was just noticing that the um, welcome one on obesity and nutrition seems to be a, a classic one that does clearly also um, affect children. And I just wondered if there's a sort of think piece you could run us through whether there will be a, a new way we we'll be looking at that or whether we will just do a looking at adults in that particular thing. We have done one on children, um, but I can't remember how long ago it was. We had a spotlight review mm-hmm. on obesity and dental. It was the same time, yeah. um, a whole day on what should be done and what could be done. Um, I have to say nothing appeared to be done regarding the dental side of it. So um, I'm not necessarily optimistic that anything particularly um, great has been done on the obesity side either. But certainly there is a spotlight review available. Um, I have a copy somewhere. It will be yeah. Democratic Services will have it of the uh, outcomes and the recommendations from spotlight review on childhood obesity. Uh, okay, thanks. That'd be great. If we can include that as a background paper, it would be um, really helpful. And I think the, the point is with all ages commissioning, and actually it makes sense to look at this as a, as a family, a whole family approach. Um, otherwise, you know, you're never really going to um, be able to understand uh, the issue in the round. It's Councillor Tennant. On, on exactly the same issue, um, Talk Community have been doing a lot of very front facing, practical um, events about obesity and nutrition. Um, quite a few events that I've been to, that has been their sole purpose of being there. Um, I mean, maybe this is an indication of the way things are going. That, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to load more work onto Talk Community because I see that they are, they are present at, at a number of these meetings that are planned, but almost their presence at that one uh, to, to know literally what they are doing on the ground at the moment, again, might be useful. Um, I, as I scrolled down, I thought, oh, well, talk community will be there and they're not. Right. Um, it's just a thought. No, that's great. So if we could, if yeah. we could try and talk community yeah. and what other actions they have ongoing uh, over that subject, that would be, uh, that would um, be helpful. Yeah, and I'm aware Matt Pierce has got particular expertise in yeah. childhood obesity yeah. and that's that. It can go either way, can't it? So children learn something they can yeah. influence their parents. So in a sense, they could be... Positive, yeah, absolutely. So I think, I think that, 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 that whole family uh, approach is good. Councillor Jimmer? No, these two, they're not careful. These subjects are huge. What we are actually looking at is what the council's role is in scrutinising what we're doing and what we're able to do uh, and how we can do it. We're not going to take on the whole national programme, uh, but there's been a complete uh, failure in programme after programme nationally to control obesity in children in particular. And I think it's right that we make sure that we're not part of the problem, but we're part of the solution, mm-hmm. and make sure that whatever is being devised in terms of strategies within the county actually stand up to the scrutiny that we should be giving. To that end, one of the key areas seems to be, and part of the reason why I suggested this in the first place, was after comments have been made to me about the varying quality of school meals mm-hmm. and their nutritional content. It seemed that that was one area where we could quite easily have some control or at least some influence, and it would be good to actually look at those particular aspects uh, with, indeed, the excellence that we have in the form of Matt Pierce who writes on it and lectures on it, that we can actually look at that and potentially really have some sort of impact. The second, obviously, is regard to curriculum and what's happened to physical education within curriculum because that's become a very minor point of part of it. I think two hours a week is the suggestion. Well, I'm sorry, that just isn't gonna match up to the input, never mind the output in terms of uh, nutrition. So I think those are areas where we have a chance locally of having an impact. I think also um, I'm pleased to see in there that you put the relevance of planning applications in the vicinity of homes and schools, yeah. which certainly the authority I came from, we had a policy which restricted the number of takeaways 
that were within a particular proximity of, of, of schools. Um, and that was thank you. So yeah, it was definitely something that, that I think we'll gain something looking at through the local lens yeah. and, um, and seeing what we can do. So okay, so just to get back to where we're at in the agenda, um the recommendation is that the healthcare and wellbeing scrutiny committee annual work plan 2022-2023 be agreed. And um can I ask if Hilary Hall, who's in attendance virtually, has any comments that she'd like to make at this time about the work programme? Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, uh, no particular comments. Clearly, we'll we'll ensure that they're all properly scoped for coming forward to for consideration by the committee. But no particular Sorry, comments. Hilary, can't hear at the moment. Oh. Techno issue. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, Chair? Because those are two things we have with the very specific to so we need to decide whether. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure if you can hear me, Chair. Yes, yes. yes. Thank, thank you. Really <laughs> So that, thank you, uh, uh, Hilary Hall. Have you got any comments on the work programme? Uh, no particular comments on the work programme, Chair. Um, obviously, we need to, we'll need ensure that they're properly scoped for you as they come forward, but no particular comments on, on, on it as it stands. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so can I have a proposer and a seconder for the recommendation? Councillor Tillett, Councillor Gandhi. All in favour? So moving on. Agenda item number eight, which is the task and finish group report on the impact of the intensive poultry industry on human health and well-being. And um, before we get uh, into this too much, I'm, I'm, I just want to record my thanks to uh, Councillor Norman for chairing this task and finish, and Councillors Marsh, Councillor Summers, Councillor Shaw for giving up their time to this piece of work. And um, also my thanks to the officers who worked alongside members, to the witnesses who agreed to speak with the committee to assist their understanding. And I would also like to thank members of the public who took the time and trouble to share their experience and thoughts with the committee and although each individual letter is not included in the public pack, I can assure members of the public who wrote that every letter has been carefully considered. So my thanks on behalf of the committee to all those members who, who put in all this work. Um, so can I invite Councillor Norman, the chairperson of the task finish group, to introduce the report, please. Councillor Norman. Um, yes, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you for inviting me along um, as, as I'm not, not a member of your committee. Um, I echo the thanks that you've also um, uh, given for all the input that we've had to this, um, to this uh, piece of work. And uh, yes, I'm really appreciative of my fellow uh, members of the Task and Finish group and officers who supported us, as well as the people who contributed in different ways to, um, to our considerations of what we were thinking about and talking about. Um, it is quite a long, quite a lot of work here. There are a lot of uh, um, appendices and uh, I hope you've um, found it interesting reading. Uh, we certainly found the whole process of considering these issues um, really interesting, uh, frustrating in many ways because so little evidence uh, appeared to be available or, or actually existed. Um, and frustrating because it's quite difficult to tease out the sort of specific issue that we were looking at when there were so many associated uh, you know, issues that we're all quite concerned about. Um, so um, I, I don't want to say a great deal about it. Uh, as you have seen in my introduction, as well as the report itself, uh, we are lay people. We, we have no claim to any sort of expertise in this area, which is why we're so particularly appreciative of the input from, from various 
uh, witnesses and as well as our own officers. Um, and uh, we, um, we came to no clear conclusion. And I think that is in itself uh, says a great deal. So as I put in the fourth paragraph, we did not find enough evidence to conclude that intensive poultry units may be harmful to health, although there were many in indications and much anecdotal evidence. And that's something which I think we're all aware of simply by living in Herefordshire. Um, we get this feedback all the time from our residents uh, and if anyone attends planning meetings, they'll be aware of a great deal of that as well. But that is not conclusive. And so much of what we've done in preparing our report and particularly in making recommendations is to flag up the, the, the really urgent need for a great deal to, more to be done in terms of research and finding out about what is happening and what the evidence, you know, pinning down the evidence. Um, and uh, that is what we're asking for in many respects. Um, and also, as I mentioned briefly, we, we feel a lot more work needs to be done on those related issues, uh, whether it's water quality, climate change, biodiversity, tourism and so on. They are all, to, to some extent, linked in, although they weren't specific to what we were looking at. Um, so uh, the, the, um, the, the recommendations are, there are a number of them, as, as you'll be, as you will have seen. Um, so I'm just finding my, my, this is my page. Um, and that's really where we read your views, your thoughts, your comments, your criticisms, uh, may well be some of those. Um, and we hope you'll accept in some form or another the recommendations which we actually have made. So I don't think I'm going to say any more than that. Um, just a quick look to see whether I need to pick out anything specific that we... Um, no, I think I'll leave it at that and, and, and wait for questions. And I'm very pleased that um, uh, Mark Willimont has uh, joined us, which is great. Thank you very much, Mark, and Francis Howie, who both advised and supported us. And I'm sure where I'm unable to answer questions, they'll be able to come in and uh, enlighten us in whatever way they can. So thank you very much, Cher. I'm going to leave it at that and, and, and ask for comments. Thank you, that's, that's true. We've had two questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, one of my concerns, uh, there needs to be a, a far more research in, in this subject to start with. And my biggest concern, in my opinion, is that the lack of, of government regulate, regulations or the lack of government doing their job as far as regulations are concerned. They seem to put it in the back of, background all the time, but they don't do because you have a lot of action. So I think we need to uh, lobby the government to do much more than what they're doing. And, and the health, or not, not the CGS anymore, whatever it is, to do a lot more than what they're doing because I think it needs to be looked at. There's enough evidence to make you want to look, I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Summers. Councillor Tennant. Thank you, Chair. When, um, when people are, are, are encouraged to submit scientific recordings and records, um, people are often very reluctant uh, to submit things if there isn't much to report. Um, but actually, of course, an absence of information in itself is sometimes um, really important. And I think in some ways, <coughs> That's the single biggest thing that comes out of this report is that there are so many glaring holes, nothing to do with the Tarsen Finnish group, but just the complete absence of information. Um, and, and obviously, I, I agree with Councillor Summers about um, you know much more has got to be done. But I think if nothing else, it has flagged up that there is a great deal that we don't know, um, and therefore it's only right that. The, the report concludes we can't make a conclusion because we don't know. At least we're a bit more clear now about what we, we know what we don't know now. Um, I think the, the limited engagement of the Environment Agency in particular with this is, is really um, sad, is probably the, the most polite way of putting it. I think 
I, you know, I, I, I do understand. I think we've, we've all probably individually had experience with the Environment Agency of, of almost impossibility of getting information out of them, you know, on a world by world basis. That, uh, but, you know, you, you might have hoped that a bit more engagement was possible. One of the things that I that sort of stood out in particular was um, the the um, the request on on how many complaints there were, and I think that's really relevant given that we have asked members of the public to report information and and how they feel about it, um, and and the slightly well, it's not glib, but it's a rather arbitrary estimate, isn't it, to say well it will be at least seventy eight hours work and therefore we cannot justify it. Well, I say it's arbitrary because, lo and behold, there are 78 IPUs in the county. So clearly someone has gone, well, it's about an hour for each one. <laughs> um, and that in itself is quite telling, isn't it? I think that they're saying, on average, each IPU um, has got a, an hour's worth of complaints for us to tabulate and, and, and to report to, to, the, to the task and finish group. Um, and yet, despite that, there have been no enforcement actions in the whole county. Um, and there seems to be a, an imbalance there between 78 hours worth of reporting complaints and yet no enforcement. And if, if the Environment Agency, God forbid if they were actually here today, I'd go, Are you, do you sleep well, knowing that there have been that, that number of complaints and yet nothing has come to enforcement? Um, it might be that they say that a lot of the complaints are anecdotal and, and, and trivial and, and not enforceable. But again, we just don't know. Uh, even a breakdown of the nature of the sort of complaints would have been really useful. Um, so, yeah, um, thank you very much for telling us or show, starting to shine a light on, on how much more we need to know. Um, and and even, even the absence of fact kind of colours how readily we can make some of these recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Turner. I think that the, it, was, it always struck me as being a very specific problem around odour nuisance uh, and the subjective nature of that and how difficult it is to, to mm. monitor and control. Um, and indeed, I think from, you know, when, when we have a, an application for an IPU, it come with a, an odour modelling report from um, a very limited number of companies that will do mm. this uh, to demonstrate the impact or otherwise of the, uh, the spread of odour from any particular installation. Um, to my knowledge, and uh, you know, if anyone in the room or on the virtual board has got any other knowledge, to my knowledge, we have never sense checked or fact checked the models assessments. And I think it would be worthwhile if we would consider that because it would give confidence mm -hmm. that the models assessments are, are correct. And that in turn give confidence to residents and to planners and to people on the planning committee when you're, you're just dealing with something that seems very abstract. Um, and so I think it would be a piece of it would be worthwhile for everybody to, to, to truth test or to whatever the phrase is, test it in reality on a, the, what the model assessment of any installation was versus what it's, how it's actually performing. Um, and also likewise, the spread of PM2.5, which is also modeled uh, that you could actually see what, it, what is the spread. Uh, um, so, I, I, so I'm sort of thinking, you know, what are the practical steps that you can take to actually start to fill in some of the knowledge gaps that, that, that are around this, um, rather than, 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 it's, than sort of just saying, well, we're going to ask a government body to do it, or we're going to ask it. Because there are things that we might do locally to, to start to uh, put, put more reassurance around this. I mean, especially mindful of, 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 of what you've just said about the, the limited number of companies who carry out some of these monitors, you know, maybe it, it, it could be as simple as, as the council identifying um, relevant companies and organisations that could carry out some of this um, checking work so that um, when an application or, or, or whatever comes forward, that the, 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 
the council will be able to react fairly quickly and go, well, we've identified company X, Y, and Z. Um, well, Y have done the work in, in, in the application, so let's go to X or Z and ask them to, to confirm it. And, uh, and to go back to the report, I mean, I, I, I absolutely, you know, I totally understand the council and Norman, it's, it is um, one of those subjects that, you, that it leads on inevitably into other areas. Um, but I, I'm not sure whether that, that supports recommendations that are without the scope of the original report. Uh, and uh, so I have a, a question mark in my mind about that. Um, I would say specifically uh, <coughs> working with the industry to encourage the adoption of a county-wide waste manure management strategy to apply the farming rules for water. Uh, and under 5.4, encouraging local MPs to request accurate monitoring and recording of national quantities of manure and manure management. It's, it just seems like that's, that's a... <coughs> without the scope. Um, and the other thing I'm just going to flag up to the committee is that you've got recommendations here. This is... I'll just hopefully point out, but this is because this has come from a task and finish group. So this is a recommendation to us, but we cannot then make a recommendation to ourselves. So where you've got recommendations at the Healthcare and Wellbeing Street, you need to do something. We, 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 we would have to find a way of making that a, a, a recommendation to the executive to understand these things. Thanks so much. Um, I, I was just going to say, we're moving on to the recommendations now. Which, um, <laughs> You can decide that to stay before that minute, if that's what, okay, and I have the structure to make it. Well, uh, I want to comment on the report. Yeah, let's carry on with the report first. Sorry, sorry, Councillor Marsh. Yeah, if I may, thank you. I just want to comment on the report. Um, this is this report is clearly being done with well intention. It unfortunately is going to into areas where there is quite considerable scientific knowledge where there is considerable knowledge, which is not portrayed in this report. I did a brief uh, survey of the literature, just uh, I haven't got time to do a full systematic review around the subject, but that's what's fundamentally needed by the nature of the title, Impact Intensive Poultry is on Human Health and Wellbeing. I would always do a systematic review or in, try to get one done. As you know, some of you are aware, I chair a government committee that provides scientific input and it's one of the scientific committees and responsible to uh, three governments and uh, work obviously as part with the chief scientists. So the work that we do constantly requires us to derive evidence to look at this. And I was very grateful the opportunity was afforded to me to come and speak to the, to the group. Um, unfortunately, I didn't see the final report until latterly. And uh, I have to say, I was concerned with its content and its tone, mainly because there are aspects within it which are inaccurate or wrong. Uh, there are also aspects within it where the implication by the way in which it is written uh, would be, I suppose, uh, generously scientifically unsound is the phrase that I would use. In other words, conclusions drawn when the evidence doesn't actually support that. And whilst I noticed the comment about the absence of evidence doesn't mean that necessarily that there is causation, uh, one has to be very cautious with that because sometimes the absence of evidence is because there is no evidence to suggest there is causation. So let's look at both of them. I try always to be even handed because that's ex absolutely what I have to do in anything that I'm undertaking uh, in the work that my committee undertakes. So I have some fairly fundamental questions about this. It, the title uh, was the impact of intensive poultry industry on human health and well-being on the poultry industry. It wanders off into pigs at one point. It wanders off into, it doesn't break down the poultry industry into whether it's broilers, layers, uh, turkeys, ducks, uh, whatever. So it, it's sort of an overarching view. 
which in itself may make a difference to what the interpretation and the outcome is. It talks about, for example, anything above 40,000, which is quite correct. That, that is an IPU in terms of at least one, if not two pieces of legislation. But it then goes on to say there's not no evidence as many other uh, below that level. Well, actually, there's a register of every poultry holder in this county, over 50 birds. You have to, by law, uh, report that. So the knowledge should be there and is there. And I think, unfortunately, this uh, report, and I appreciate the difficulty you may have had in getting some of the information, and indeed, it won't always be readily available to those who are trying to do the day job in every sense of the word in the official. So I'm very mindful that when I'm doing these reports, it takes about eight people in the first part of a year to very often to get to a, an output that is fit to put in front of the minister. So I'm very conscious of the time and knowledge base that's required. But I do think we have to be very careful if we use this as a basis for taking forward for policy making and we have to be suitably critical. Now it does in itself, I think, raise the question about what the role of such task and finish groups are, the extent to which they take evidence, from whom they take evidence, the breadth of that evidence that's required. And in itself, it, that is a subject which perhaps needs to be considered in a broader construct for all task and finish groups. But certainly when venturing into health and well-being, uh, guidance undoubtedly from uh, those within the uh, officials within the, uh, here within the Public Council is to be welcomed. But there are quite a few people doing work on these particular subjects outside. And indeed getting evidence from some of those would have been really helpful. Some of the evidence that's published is some of the systematic reviews that are published already on uh, bioaerosols in poultry houses might well have been something that you would like to have added in and had a view to look at. I suggest to you that if you look on Google Scholar, which is one of the ways of uh, doing that and search under that, you will find information that might well be helpful. Um, that is only one source. Normally when we're doing systematic reviews, we're using more than one library source and a science library source in order to do the searches. So I do have a bit of a problem with some of the content. I do have a bit of a problem, therefore, with deriving conclusions. But the overall arching one of we need to be engaging with everybody. And I was a little disappointed that uh, in the recommendations that the executive engages with it seemed to me for everybody except those who were producing it. And I thought that seemed to me to be rather important. Um, so that it, it, it's, it's a case of, thank you very much, noted, content therein, question mark, outcomes, I, might, I don't want to go line by line necessarily, unless you wish me to, but I want to make sure that when there's something is derived as a conclusion or recommendation, that it's supported in the evidence in the, in the, uh, the bulk of the document. That is a fundamental requirement, usually with anything you do. You can, there's a methodology, there's interviews, there's visits, there's whatever. There are re the conclusions that you draw from that and then recommendations that flow from that. But you can't have a recommendation that hasn't been come from the, the methodology and from the conclusions. There has to be a logical process in it. Now, I'm looking at this as a scientist, I appreciate that. Um, this is now in a political context. I'm well aware of that, so I can put the other hat on if you like. But it is that policy has to be advised by whatever the available science is at the time. And the age of a lot of the references in here, I found uncomfortable. I mean, for example, there's a, a section on uh, the use of antibiotics, or use of antimicrobials, right? Antimicrobials were banned in the EU for growth promotion in 2006, haven't been used in the industry for years. The amount of antimicrobials now used in the poultry industry is minute in comparison. Of. There is a dispute at the moment with the EU over the use of metaphylactic antibiotics as against prophylactic and as against growth prophylactic. Now, prophylactic is stopped, 
metaphylactic in this country, but not in the EU, and treatment undoubtedly required and is used. But the amount used is startlingly small by comparison with historic values. And certainly by comparison with the problems with the human <coughs> describing is not an issue uh, of uh, any great magnitude. The selection of antibiotics, or antimicrobials rather, predominantly trimethoprim and um, uh, ampicillin are ones which, which there's enough problems with the human prescribing, I would suggest certainly uh, ampicillin, um, but uh, not an issue with regard to the majority of uh, prescribing and, and risk from poultry. The problem of quoting WHO reports, WHO reports, is their worldwide problems, not in this country. We are nowhere near the level of the WHO levels that are quoted. And you have to be very careful, therefore, when selecting the evidence to make sure it's appropriate, not just to the country, but to the county. Because after all, at the end of the day, this report is designed for our residents within the county, many of whom will be employed by one, of the, one or many of the, the, the uh, poultry businesses, many of them by having small poultry units themselves. And we have to be careful we don't become alarmist in the outturn. And I think that's one of the points that I would like to get across. I do welcome your finding at the end, in which you're very clear, in which you say there is no evidence of, but you then go on and say there's lots of anecdotes and whatever. No, there isn't. There's 64 people who've commented out of 191,000 residents. It, it, it statistically doesn't stack up as significant. There is anecdote that is common, and the content of those comments, equally, when you look at them and break them down into the different causations and different suggestions, many of them are unte untested as to whether or not they have validity. I am well aware that there's a lot of people who do not like intensive poultry units, just like that means production. And I'm not for one moment here uh, trying to either protect or defend or suggest others. I'm merely saying that if you derive evidence, the evidence must be based factually. Otherwise, I think it can be misleading. So I welcome your final comment. There is no evidence. I actually could find you a little bit of evidence that might suggest there might be some connection. But the dilution factor of both ammonia and of dust particles in the atmosphere around is sufficient to disperse the likely uh, affecting agents in most situations. So again, we have to be very careful. The other final comment I make, sorry to go on, but it is rather a subject which is close to my heart and which I've spent quite some time uh, looking at, is the fact that, of course, one of the most important indicators of problems are birds. Birds have an anatomy which has an air sac as well as a, a lung. They don't rely on a lung. They have air sacs within. They're incredibly sensitive to infection, dust, and ammonia levels. That is why modern uh, uh, housing for them actually monitors everything about the bird. So possibly the birds are getting a better deal here than the humans, and I'm quite prepared to suggest that. But I, I do want to sort of try to get across that if, the, if there was something remotely wrong, the birds would be your best indicator, and almost the canary in the, in the mind, yeah. as to the problem that is likely to be occurring. And they should get a remarkably good indication. And not wishing to turn into sort of monetarist terms, particularly around what is a clearly a health and welfare issue. I can assure you that any company that suddenly finds itself with a lot of birds dying in the course of a respiratory disease, the primary problem is probably in these birds normally, would very rapidly want to know themselves why it's going wrong. So they can sometimes be your friend more than your enemy, if I may use that rather um, emotive language in this regard. So, as I say, I do think it's important that we all work together on this because one thing's for sure, the industry itself doesn't want poultry that are going to be in circumstances which is going to render them 
unfit for human consumption and uh, in welfare terms that doesn't give them a life uh, at least worth living, if, if, if not a good life. The language which, of course, I'll spend my time working with. Thank you. I think as, a, as an overall comment, thank you, Councillor So as an overall comment, what, what I want to, what I think is important is that we both acknowledge the effort and thought that went into this. We don't lose it as a piece of work. We try to get it to the place where we are all happy with it because, we, because it has to pass from us to the executive as from, from us or it, or it just gets noted. So that, that's for us to kind of consider what is the what is the way forward here, uh, both in terms of the report and the and the recommendation. So I think there, there are recommendations that I would like to see that are not here. So I, I kind of think that there, there would be add-ins for me. That would be where I'd want to take it. But I also accept that perhaps the Jim has got reservations about some of the language in the report. So the question that I'm just floating is can we get this to a point where we will have consensus? Um, so that it can move forward. Councillor Marsh. Mm -hmm. I, I'm happy to acknowledge that the report could be tighter and that had it had a team of eight highly trained scientists working for a year on it, it would undoubtedly be better. But I think there are some things, it seems to me, that um, clearly do emerge and a lot of important information that is in it. And in a sense, all of them are about cumulative impact. So it seems to me entirely clear that both ammonia and particulates are known not to be good for human health, but ammonia there's a, a national reduction figure. And that using, I'm afraid I hadn't done this till very recently, but I found the EA's own calculator, and if I've got it right, then over 500 tonnes a year of ammonia and of PM10 are emitted by the poultry houses in Herefordshire and PM 2.5s that aren't even down to the EA. I mean, I struggle to imagine how many particulars there might be in the town. I, you know, tried searching for how much does a PM 10 weigh and there was a resounding silence, but to be truthful, 500 tonnes of PM 10s must be a very large number and, and they do travel a long way. So I think I, you know, absolutely accept that in the terms of did this house cause this damage to this people? No, we're, we're nowhere near that. But Mm. In terms of are there regular planned active emissions to air, partly in order to keep the lovely birds happy, that's why all the ammonia and particulates are so <coughs> impressively <coughs> discharged into the air that we all share. And the other thing is that it does seem clear, both from the people who got back and from um, independent work done by social scientists, that there is considerable distress to people from um, odour related issues which could be sometimes you know physically made them sick so uh, or made them feel that they were going to gag so it is a, a mixture of physical and mental health and another very interesting finding from my point of view in response to the freedom of information request to the environment agency is that they get over £100,000 a year in income from their permitting these particular sheds. And it seems to me that um, I heard recently from someone who works for the EA that they are very keen nowadays to focus on things that produce an income. And I said, well, that was fortunate because that's exactly what the poultry sheds did. So possibly they could consider spending that money more actively. I know they have managed to get a national grant to, to employ someone um, on more enforcement, but you kind of go, you, you've got the money right here, guys. You, you don't perhaps need to go nationally. So I will, you know, hear what the feeling is in the room, but it does seem to me clear that we can say that there are emissions that are clearly, in general, not good for health and that indeed in you know the years since um, we had the health impact assessment nationally it's become a lot clearer that air pollution is a very major source of ill health 
Thanks, Josh. I think a part of the difficulty, and this is exactly this kind of takes us back to exactly where we began, which is the the, the balance between um, absence of evidence, evidence of absence. You know, what would the where you don't know. So when you don't know something, obviously what you're going to do is try is try to define it through other routes. If you look at external, different or parallel lines. So for instance, you might look at the health and safety executive, um, recent 2022 uh, technical and legal guidance, which um, con contains uh, the, the following, which I will read if I may, poultry dust, may vary in composition from pure wood dust to a complex mixture of organic and inorganic particles, fecal material, feathers, dander, skin material, mites, bacteria, fungi and fungal spores and endotoxins, depending on the type of birds, the work activity and the point in the growing or production cycle. Some of the individual components, e.g. storage mites and softwood dust, are known aspergens, which are substances capable of causing occupational asthma. So clearly this is a work environment. Um, and, they, and they did a specific report, which is RR 655, and that has quite an interesting sort of table of activities and, and monitored response to that activity. Uh, for instance, the activity associated with mucking out, um, and, and, and this was sort of monitored over time using petri dish, so uh, leading to uh, 200 million uh, colony forming units CFU per cubic metre of bacteria, 33.1. Uh, micrograms per cubic meter of dust, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so when you're looking at it in a work environment, there, very, there, there is kind of quite quite substantial evidence. So we are to suppose that somebody who is standing next to a shed doesn't experience this. When you know that the, the venting is so so that, you know, and it's that kind of knowledge gap that I that I think is really frustrating for everybody. And it? so that if you can say that if somebody in the shed is kind of you know, the, the, or, or this is what they've recorded over, over the passage of time. That I, you know, so it is not unreasonable in my mind to ask the question, uh, given that public health is one of the roles of Heritage Council, we should at least ask the question. Councillor Summers. Yeah. yeah, that's the key, I guess, is asking the questions. Um, in Herefordshire, uh, respiratory diseases increased quite substantially over the past 22, uh, 12 years. Um, but you can't really prove what has caused that because we have a high pollution level. Lampster's got a real issue with pollution right now. <coughs> um, so that there's there's a lot of reasons for everything. I have COPD, I think Carol has COPD. That's caused from a smoking. So you can't prove that it's, in, that it's caused by birds. But the lack of work done by environmental people says a lot. And I think we should be aiming at them, maybe making them look this big instead of that big, that we need to go after them and say, you're not doing your job. You've been spending money. There's this going on. We can't prove what's, that it's all to do with, with the envir environmental, but a lot of it is we need you to do your job. And I think that's where we should be aiming at quite frankly, is making sure that an environmental agency does their job. And if they don't do it, then they need to tell us why they're not doing it. That's it. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Summers. Councillor Norman. Um, thank you very much. And, and thank you, everyone, for your input, including Councillor Chinnaman, <laughs> taking it to pieces somewhat. But no, we, we, we absolutely take on board the, the good intentions behind it. I would like, if we could, in a moment, to get a little bit of feedback from the officers who advised us mm -hmm. on those comments, if we could. Um, mm -hmm. Mark Willimont and, and, and Francis Howie, it'd be good to hear what their views are on that. Um, but just a couple of other points. I think one, one of the things that we were particularly shocked by, if you like, was the Health Protection Agency's um, lack, if you like, of any sort of contribution that's up to date. 2006, really? I mean, that just seems incredible, their report on intensive farming. That must be long, long overdue and something which I believe a recommendation that we've called for, I think. Um, that was one point. Um, the, uh, the other thing was, one of the things that comes through, and again, Captain Jim might have a view on this, is that so much of what we're talking about absolutely depends on things like the quality of management, you know, you can have absolutely state-of-the-art, high-tech, modern buildings, and we do have some of those. We also have some that are very old, 
and not nearly up to those sort of standards. Mm. And, uh, and you get quality of management to, in, in terms of the actual input of the individuals doing the job. So there's all those variables, I think, that uh, really are part of the picture. It is not always going to be the same. It won't always be what we might hope and expect. Um, on animal welfare, I wouldn't presume to question Councillor Jinman on that, but I do believe that the producers do factor in some sort of percentage of loss, um, and some of that is going to be due to respiratory, uh, you know, failures, whatever you want to call it, partly because they've grown so fast and they don't have the sort of, you know, mature enough, um, uh, you know, organs, essentially. Um, but I, that is my understanding. I don't know enough about it. Quick comment on the, the 60 plus responses. Of course, they're a minute number in relation to the whole number of our, of our residents. But I think two things to say on that. One in particular is we do know that the people who speak up very often, and again, one can't guarantee it, represent a much larger number within the wider community. And I think for all of us, the, the, um, uh, the anecdotal stuff isn't just what's coming through in those responses to our request for information. It is what we all pick up simply as, you know, councillors getting feedback or as members of planning committee or whatever it might be, you do get an avalanche of stuff comes in may or may not be accurate it may not may or may not be um you know uh, scientifically sort of provable but it is there and uh, i don't know if you saw i think one did, did one of the reports go out sorry i can't remember now uh, was the, the perception of the public there was a, an interesting report done by somebody who sent it in who might be interested in what she had done and i thought that was also quite interesting again no proof with it but it's 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 part of that picture that we're sort of working within. Um, I think that's probably mostly what I wanted to say at this point, but thank you. I would like to hear what our officers say. Thanks, Councillor Jim, like to respond. Yeah, thank you. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm very, very conscious that there's always considerable interest if somebody wants to put up a new unit or whatever. I'm not suggesting for one moment there's not a huge interest in the subject. I'm not for one moment getting into the ethics of welfare and poultry in systems. Uh, I'm not suggesting that there are problems. And there are problems whether you keep them indoors, outdoors, anyway. And uh, so it, it's uh, often people tend to forget that when you quantify it, yes, because you've got 40,000 birds in a, in a particular shed, it's interesting when you put 40,000 birds outside and we have a death of the fox, the, uh, uh, the polecat, or anything else. So I, yeah, I, I, there are always the pros of those comments in this, and I totally when I didn't want to get, I don't want to get into that discussion because I don't think that's pertinent. Here. This is about whether or not it affects human health. Now there is evidence that the undoubted comments that have been made by the chair that direct contact is a real concern, and every poultry. Uh, company and every farmer who's got poultry and is working with uh, the dust and the nature of the product there and the birds, uh, the litter has to take proper precaution. You're absolutely right. And indeed, if you mention your P10s or take it down lower levels, you're absolutely right. Nobody can suggest that. The question is whether the dilution factor of being 100 metres away, 200 metres away, a mile away, makes any difference at all. Now, I lived originally very close to one particular unit, and I can tell you which day of the week that open the doors are cleaned up. I, in other words, I'm very well aware of the odour effects that can come across. So I'm not in denial. I'm merely saying that if you're going to produce evidence, and I would make the same comment about anything else, if you're going to make conclusions, and one has to be extraordinarily careful with the language that you use. The, the comparative is quite strong, but when you use the superlative, you really have got to have strong evidence to suggest that that connection is there. And I think all too often in here, the language moves to the superlative, if I may say so, to the stronger, then in fact the evidence itself would allow you to write. There may be a connection, there is a connection, a connection has been found by some workers, public <coughs> being so and so, 
and then there is an evidence trail that you can follow and understand the basis of it. Because it's not just good enough to look at the papers, you actually can look at the methodology of those papers if you're really going to do the work on this. Because sometimes the papers that are written, shall we say, uh, have an interesting methodology, which might well have been questioned, and you have to look at a later paper and see if somebody has done a criticism of the paper you just read, which you thought gave you the answer. Because it has been questioned whether their methodology was right or proper. Anybody who listens to the news today will know the considerable problem over the outsiders discussion, which uh, has to be said, I think uh, some of us who worked in some of those areas in the past had considerable concerns about, but it's a good example. <coughs> was the amyloid answer? No, it wasn't. Was it the marker? Possibly. You know, you've got, you have to take the science in its fullest extent and be very, very critical before you make uh, conclusions. And therefore, the language has to match that, those sorts of conclusions. Yeah, so for me, I think what, what I find um, frustrating, and, and I know you had uh, John Reed, did you have um, and did, did you get any sense from him? Did you ask him whether or not any of the growers uh, have voluntary monitoring in place to uh, to monitor PM two point five and ammonia from, from the sites? He certainly didn't volunteer that. Which no, I mean, I just, I just kind of think that, 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 that this is that there's very much something that they would voluntarily do because then they can. That then they can bring forward the evidence to say that there is not a problem. Yeah, what we what we have is a vacuum here of of of, of evidence. Um, you know, so as a grower, we would, you know, wouldn't you want to do that? And indeed, as a local authority, shouldn't we be looking at that when we're sense checking models, uh, scenarios for 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 over or particular matter? It's something Mark might that, that we sense check it in some way because I think our conclusion was there didn't appear to be any monitoring or at least not not anything that we could try. No, well, okay, so can we hear from you think Mr. Williams? Mr. Williams, can you chip in at this slide, please? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah, now I'm yeah, clear. Good, good. Yeah, no, thank you. That's interesting. Um, I know that I'm um, speaking on behalf of Francis as well. I mean, it's uh, something that both Francis and I have been saying to the task and finish is evidence, evidence, evidence. And in fairness to the task and finish group members, they, they understand that there is a lack of a lot of information out there. I've, I've tried to clock uh, some of the points so they might not necessarily be in exactly the order that you expect them, but it's like in the chronological order that I think is discussed. So first of all, the issue, about, the issue about environmental permits is that they've been around since the early 2000s. They went to the Environment Agency. Uh, local authorities also can do permits, and we have about 90 permits, but for smaller industry. But for various reasons, it went to the Environment Agency. But the way it works, no matter the industry sector, but for IPUs, it's everything within the boundary of. So comments, for example, about odour and smell very often to do with ploughing and spreading is something outside of the control of environmental permits. Um, pre, probably about 2002 or three, when it went into permitting, it used to be the job of the environmental health officer to deal with things like smell and dust and nuisance, and that was under statutory nuisance provisions. So that part of it perhaps helps to understand the limitations indeed of the environment agency. Um, about the way they work. And also I suppose the limitations are, and I think it's in the report, their, their regulation is based upon industry sector guidance for intensive poultry units. So they have to be very consistent. Uh, and there isn't a requirement, for example, for monitoring, because it's understood that if they build in a certain way, then it shouldn't have the impact. And, you know, based on some old 2006 Health Protection Agency information which presumably is still used or, or in some way referred to in the absence of anything else that's the way that they work and um, the points are very good points about you know the monitoring and the pollutants it will be particulate matter particulate matter uh, 10 pm 10 2.5 and ammonia mostly coming out of the fans which over the years have changed from side handle to now on the top and the reason why they're on the top is because they disperse further and Councillor Jimman's quite correct by the very nature of their positioning. 
they, they used to be 400 meters away, but you rarely find them sort of within about 300 meters. Um, all the air quality screening work done at the planning application stage, including work done by our environmental health officers, has never found any of the IPU units to actually breach the uh, PM2 and 10 standard uh, or the PM2.5 standard. So you know, the task and finish group were advised about that, obviously, but there's obviously other things like odor, which people will complain about, and that's very difficult to pinpoint. And those are impacts, I suppose, that people have in relation to mental health and well-being. Um, if they smell it, they don't like it, and it upsets them. Um, and that's a very emotive subject, isn't it? Um, so just to repeat, you know, the regulation is environment agency led, except for the smaller units. And Councillor Jim is absolutely right. We know where all the uh, chicken units or the chicken establishments are. Anything over 50 birds has to be registered with the animal plant health uh, uh, agency. And our animal health officers basically have that all pinpointed on GIS. But we're looking at the bigger ones, I suppose, in relation to impact. Um, poultry numbers probably is accurate somewhere between 16 and 17 million. I think that's been established. It probably is semantics anyway. Comments have been made about dust and ammonia. I think we already covered about the dilution factor. You're quite right. I, mean, I used to learn when I studied uh, environmental protection that dilution is a solution of pollution. And by placing things further away, you tend to overcome that issue. And there's many other sources really are of PM 2.5 PM10, whether that's Sahara dust, whether that's salt spray crystals, whether that's agriculture, whether that's road tarmac, all those sorts of things. There's many, many things there. And as Councillor Salman says, it's difficult to know exactly what would be the cause of that people see these units. And I suppose they will associate them with those sorts of things. Um, I think from an officer point of view, the task and finish members were very, very interested in the impact upon you know, the rivers Y and Lug. Um, again, officers minded that, you know, the water that comes from the Y goes through a water treatment works and the phosphates would not be a problem, other nutrients wouldn't be a problem because of that. However, it was the mental health, I suppose, concerns of so many of the people that wrote in about that and also people that do free, free swimming and the like and uh, whether they felt that they were you know, putting themselves in danger because of E. coli, coliforms and other sort of bacteria. So those things were mentioned. Um, so there's a massive sort of mental health and river you know, aquatic environment concern. Cumulative impact that came up. That is something that planners do look at now. I do know that from when I worked closely with them before. And the last one or two applications that went through, consultants were appointed to proofread, test the odor impact assessment work submitted and they did, couldn't find fault in it. However, I think the planners, and we did have two planners, didn't we? Rebecca Jenman and Kelly Gibbons join us. The planners would be first to admit that it's a very small you know, gene pool of odor consultants you pull from. There's probably only a handful. They probably all know each other quite well. They might have learned from each other. So the challenge from that may not be as robust as you would like, but then that's what the state of you know, the industry is out there for advice on that. Um, air quality screening, I've mentioned, that's part of what we do for air quality review and assessment. We've never found a problem with any of the IPU units. Um, and we haven't probably particularly mentioned it other than perhaps by ourselves from Councillor Jinman, but from an officer point of view, we are seeing a lot more avian influenza outbreaks. Uh, so many this year, there's about half a dozen. The year before there was just one, and before that we've never had one. So something's happening, and I know the government's thrown money at a working group to look at the reasons for it. But, um, you know, so far there hasn't been anything associated with avian influenza in human health. Although we know that there is concern about it, you know, crossing and mutating, crossing the species barrier and the like. So those are sort of some of the concerns, but just to start with the words I started with, and I know Francis Howie would probably say the same evidence, evidence, evidence. That's what we lack. And I sense the frustration of the members and what they hear, but, you're, you're right, in the, the, those that made the comments, we do need to have something robust because it will be peer reviewed. Is that sufficient? Sorry for my... Thank, thank you, Mr. Lord. Um, just one question popped into my head. On those sites where, where we are, um, the 
the, the, have the license, as it were. So, I mean, whatever, car sprayers, whatever, other, other businesses. Um, if there is a, a comment from the public about emissions of some sort, what do we do about that? Well, most of the permits that we have, except for the very small ones, they actually have a monitoring requirement, so they at least have to do annual monitoring, get somebody in, or they have to have continuous monitoring, for example, if there's a abatement plant to take out dust, which is quite feasible, you know, you do that through various means, whether it's through, sort of, you know, uh, bag filtration or even through scrubbing. But, you know, if something goes wrong with that bag filter, it splits and alarm goes off and people are notified the process shuts down. Would it be technically feasible to have a similar thing on some of the sheds just to sort of... Uh, probably the air changes might make it very difficult. It's outside my expertise about the size of these units and about the air changes. But uh, I do know, and it would help, um, one or two of the farmers coming through with applications outside of the Y catchment that might have a chance of planning. Uh, are often being faced with ammonia uh, concerns, but not for human health, but from natural England in relation to deposition on the aquatic and um, yeah, the, environments the, around. Yeah, there is a real problem with ammonia. And, and uh, they are, some of the farmers are offering to put in ammonia abatement into IPU, so you know, it can be done. There's a term used in permitting called best available techniques, and there's a part that adds on to the end called not entailing excessive costs. And it's, you know, if the environment agency who write the policy and the industry sector notes decide that you want to monitor these things, it could be done. I'm sure it could be done. But at the moment, it isn't, which is why there's an absence of knowing what comes off. We just rely on dispersion and government tools like the air quality uh, screening stuff that we do for them. Yeah, I, I mean, I know just, there is a recommendation around that 5.4 um, best available techniques. Has anyone else got any questions for Mr. Wimble? Uh, Tom, a couple of things there. Um, Avian influenza, just to point out that the majority of those have not been in broilers. Um, there's over 100 and something outbreaks now. There's one yesterday, actually. Um, so they're not in the county. Um, so it has to be just a little careful again. You know, we can get the, the, the statement that there's an increase in AI and there's huge worries about why this is happening. As has been said, there is a government uh, task force looking at this now to try and see what can be done, whether indeed we're going to need to vaccinate in the future, et cetera, et cetera. Um, phosphates, there was the comment. I completely left any comment with regard to that aside because I'm spending quite a lot of time, as other councillors may know. Um, I'm equally concerned about phosphates, rivers, conditions, and so on. But equally, I'm aware of the discussions with uh, industry who are working incredibly hard to try and wait to find those solutions as well. And I come back to my original point, everybody together to solve the problem. This is not a finger pointing exercise, yeah. but it's definitely got to be done that way. And um, those who were at the Royal Welsh Show on Monday will have seen the uh, First Minister in Wales launch the uh, programme for Wales with regards to river pollution. Uh, and water pollution and was very concerned about it, got everybody in the room to do it. Uh, a very useful document was also produced by Yen, if you can write, uh, on the whole of that subject for the farming world. So, yes, not human health directly. I'm very cautious with the words mental health when David is in the room, um, because he knows only too well that we have to be very careful where we use the language around that where there are concerns and where there is genuine diagnosable mental health. We have to separate those two uh, because it can be uh, alarmist sometimes if we're not careful in the language that we use around that. And I think um, Dr. Howie has stressed that to us frequently during our, um, during our discussion. Okay. Uh, that's the sounds. I did ask the question of Mara, uh, what were they doing with the older farms? And they were re recommending that they upgrade, but it has to go through planning. Now, maybe we, we could have something to do with that. Uh, there are quite a few older ones out there. The new, all the newer ones are, 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 do, are going right to the, the nth degree. But some of the older ones are probably causing more 
than what the new ones are doing. So perhaps we need to be looking at that. I'm not sure if there's anything from offices on that one. Um, it's just a thought. But it, it did say they were recommending, maybe we should push them to recommend harder. Uh, just a thought. Thank you. Um, so just briefly to come back on that. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. And this, of course, is the dilemma. You've got planning applications yes. to improve, but well, sometimes the words enlarge, etc. cetera, uh, occur. Perhaps on the other side of that, it's the new boiler directive, uh, particularly in the boiler world, and uh, the better chicken uh, program, all of these are aimed at uh, improving the welfare of the birds and therefore getting the houses better is better for the birds as well as for the human population that might surround it. As has just been said by Mark, the, the principle of moving the, uh, the outlets to the roof was to improve the position for the humans. Uh, uh, so it, it is one of those dilemmas, and I, that's why I said we're not going to get into the ethics of welfare, uh, ethics side of the production, but that's a good example where we might actually improve the welfare of the birds by improving the quality of the houses. Could, could I just make a very quick comment on that? And again, it's, it's one of those things that's totally unprovable or pinnable down, but one of the distresses, if you like, you want to put it in that rather vague way, does actually come from the welfare issues, you know, perceptive, perception of, not necessarily the realities, but the perception of, that is quite a, you know, quite a big factor, in, actually, but not something we can prove or pin specifically down, but certainly something we've picked up on. Yeah, I, I accept that, but I would come back and say quite simply the amount of work that's done on the welfare of birds in these situations, and so I come back to the ethical question rather than the welfare question, uh, because the well-being of those birds, every aspect of it is catered for other than the fact they're not outside, uh, and even now with the outdoor units, which are increasing, it, it, I mean, there are endless papers on behaviour and welfare. It's huge. Uh, and so it, it is a very difficult one. subject. And their mental health is better than ours. But it is the time. people's <laughs> perception, and that is very difficult. Uh, but it's not the same perception when they want chicken at a price on the plate, etc. And that becomes oh, part of the, the agenda. It's very difficult on that. Yeah. And it's not for us to solve today. No, no, no. Okay, <laughs> I'll pass again. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I've got a number of um, intensive poultry units in my ward, and I have to say, um, since I've been um, cancer, I've never received a, a complaint regarding any of them. Um, although I do receive complaints of people who feel stressed and anxious about the noise that comes from the quarry, um, the, the noise and the disruption that comes through the lorries that go through the villages with their quarries uh, stuff. And during potato season, um, the issue of rock potatoes and with no tarps um, going through villages and potatoes coming off and breaking people's windows. So there are, there are all sorts of different forms of industry um, and if you go into urban, more urban areas, you know, landfill sites, um, there are all sorts of different industries that make either a lot of smell or noise that will be distressing people. I, I, and in some cases, if it's a continual noise or a continual smell, will end up causing mental health problems. My concern, my concern about this report is, um, and if we come up with some other recommendations that um, I can support, and there are a few in here that I can, um, is the fact that there is no evidence in many cases to support what is being stated here. And <clears throat> therefore, as it stands at the moment, I would note this report, but I could not adopt this report. Thank you. I think it might be useful at this stage um, to go through the recommendations. We have we do have the potential today to identify 
uh, changes to the report or changes to the recommendations, because as it will, they, it becomes our report, our recommendations. So we have to be behind it to, to, to send it on to the executive. Um, if, if we can get this to a point where, you know, we, we, we think we'd be content with that, I think probably we're not going to do it in the meeting today, but we can bring it back to the next meeting just, just for a kind of final, yeah, you know, good to go. If we can get it to that place. Uh, and, I, and I think we can. Councillor Price. Oh, yeah. Is the planning control regarding these buildings as opposed to ordinary planning for just general buildings? Is a completely different thing, aren't they? No. There probably is. Or is that? No, it's the planning commission in the in a normal no. way. They're very complicated applications, oh, yeah. usually, though, with a, an enormous number of yeah, uh, yeah. technical yes. reports that are finished. Yeah. But the process is already the same. A lot longer and more complicated. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. <laughs> Sure. If it's only help, I'm, I'm very happy to work with the uh, task of finish group and as I did indicate before we met today to try to um, perhaps allay some of my concerns if they are happy to do that uh, and to look at the language. But I'm very mindful that uh, this lies with the committee, not with me uh, in that regard. So yeah, so I mean, my, I mean, my view is I don't want to lose this as a piece of work. I want it to go forward. I want it to, um, you know, go up to the executive with a set of recommendations that we can all be happy with. And so therefore, I think it's inevitable that we're going to have a bit more uh, chewing and praying over it if that's acceptable to everyone at this point. And, and, we, and we think we can get this. So it might be worthwhile um, to set the report to one side for now. Look at the recommendations. And can we identify recommendations that we are broadly happy with? Recommendations that we are not happy with? Recommendations <laughs> that we think we might get to a place of happiness with? Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. So if we take the first recommendation. Which is simply about the executive reviewing the accessibility of council information because I think you picked up on frustration over people not knowing how to how to complain, how to make contact, who to speak to, what to do, and, and it is kind of annoying. And actually, we should have that generally about everything, to be fair. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see that's a problem. I think that I quite like the idea of the fact-checking myth-busting, because I think a lot of public perception is, is that there's an issue around public perception and I think it would make sense to try to get that, you know, work with the industry, work with everyone, try and get that sort of more up to date, what we know, as it were. I don't see any harm in that. I think that's a, I would say information but, is a good thing. Really, but, but I'm not sure about the parenthesis, um, particularly bearing in mind Councillor Jimman's comments that that, fact checking myth busting documents should necessarily be based on appendix one and two if the science within that okay. is is debatable at least yeah i'm happy to yeah that i mean I, 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 I think it doesn't need to be based on anything i think it's no. what, what we want is just to, just to make sure that yeah we, that I mean, people are myth busting are, is is very is very important yeah and myth, there are myths on both sides of this, there's yeah, a balance of absolutely. myths here. But what we don't want to do, and what, which is why I'm nervous with this report, because you know, I have got several IPUs in my board, we don't want to frighten people who up until today were not frightened no. and didn't feel unsafe or unhealthy or anxious and suddenly are going to feel unsafe and unhealthy and anxious. And that's my, my biggest concern about this. So I think <coughs> myth busting is, is important, but it needs to be based on what facts we have. That uh, yeah, I, mean, I think I would look to uh, Dr. Harry to, to guide us in that and, to, and to, to set the tone of that in a way that is not 
going to be uh, in any way alarmist or uh, so to, 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 to emphatic. Um, I think one of the biggest things is their well-being, chickens' well-being. It's it's automatically assumed that they're all kept in this big thing and, and their life is lousy. Well, yeah. in, in fact, it's, it's, it's the other way around, probably. They're all taken care of right to the nth degree and mental health is really a concern because if they don't have good mental health, they, they don't get good meat. It's simple. So that, again, this is, this is sort of, you know, not to try and chart with a you know, document that is not looking at either end of the extreme yeah. of the argument, but actually trying to, trying to say what it's a tough one though, isn't it? I think the point about making sure it's based on, you know, acceptable yeah. evidence is, is, is very, it's perfectly reasonable. I think so. so I think, I think we've got the, I think it seems to me there's quite a lot around 5.1 that, that we've been up with. So 5.2, so this is a this is a recommendation for us to do something, but I understand we can't recommend ourselves to do something. So we would have to translate to yeah. we're asking the executive. <laughs> and that that seems to me to be kind of broadly sensible to say that we don't duplicate and try to triangulate what we're doing. Um I, I'm not anticipating that we're going to have regular uh, scrutiny meetings about the intensive poultry industry but were we to do that i would have thought that industry representatives would be part of that i don't, I don't see where there would be a problem with that Has anyone got a problem with 5.2 well i mean i mean uh, bullet point two five point two mm -hmm. if you take out any of you and poultry farms that should apply to any bit of task and finish work. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think it, it happens to. It doesn't really. Neither of these really relate to this particular piece of work. They should be standard things. So you think, you think that the, the base is not necessary? This, this well, I'm, I'm hoping that what we've, we've we've gone through with regards to how we're going to run sc scrutiny going forward that mm. we would take these things into yeah. consideration on any task and finish group that we did. And so we would make sure that we involve, you know, members of the public, mm. experts, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on any. Did you have any particular in mind with this uh, beyond good practice? Um, which I, well, I think that's a very good point. I mean, I would say that this would reinforce that, which wouldn't hurt at all. Um, but I think the idea was to engage with the relevant, you know, the point is that we do want mm. dialogue, we do want yeah. to uh, have that <clears throat> engagement where it's helpful and where it's going to take them forward. So I'd like to see it stay there, but I mean, at that point it's already there ideally in, in general, but this would reinforce it. I mean, I think it might, it might be better if we're asking the executive to do something, that we could ask the executive to engage with the industry and, and work with them to uh, come up with either a voluntary code or, uh, or with individual growers to uh, sense check as far as possible um, dust dispersal modelling and odour modelling um, and, and just to give that reassurance around um, the, the way the, the farms are, are functioning. Would that be an additional bit um, along with that or, or do we have something along those lines already? Well we have, the, the, the monitoring request is, is, is um, going to other bodies, but, like, yeah, but I just think that we, you know, as, as the planning authority, or just you know, in a way, um, having a constructive relationship with the industry, that 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 that, that would be the sort of engagement I think would be useful. Well, yeah. Councillor Jim, yeah, I just want to make a point that there is a tendency to think that uh, um, one local firm, the bar is the key. Yes, they're the biggest, but not the only one in the area. Two sisters are quite important. You've got then got all the laying companies. Uh, you've got the turkey companies, so it's not it's not a single mm. company, and I think that's quite important to, to remember. So I, I don't know. I point to any any views. Do you keep it, lose it, revise it? I, I I probably would take it out as a as a recommendation. Yeah. But somewhere in the paper, somewhere in the minutes, we note. Yeah. And it might be 
in the minutes of something we've discussed earlier, that we make sure that we're doing a task and finish, that we in, involve all organisations and, and people that we possibly can who have something that they can add to the work that we're doing. Yeah, but there's a good idea, it's just not really recommended. That's part of the scrutiny period. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's a general... Yeah, and say this with bullet point, point one. Yeah, I okay. think bullet point one is, is covered actually by the, the board that are basically going to make sure that we don't overlap on, on work. Yeah, so I think 5.2 both points are covered elsewhere. Yeah, and we can talk about that. Okay. Come back. I did originally um, suggest that there were two aspects of this. There's one, what happens with task and finish groups, and two, what happens with this particular report. And I think they're two separate things. I think this has been a really useful learning uh, task for all and for other task and finish groups to learn from this as to how or what the way in which task and finish groups might need to work and to have that discussion as to how far you go. I mean, I'm very conscious here that we've, we're delving into some quite complex science which um, no one person is going to know the answers. Absolutely don't. Uh, it's going to be a case of uh, how far you go. Do you do systematic reviews of the science if that's required? And if so, who does them? You know, these are complex questions, and I just don't. I don't want to set a pattern that is beyond sensible council reach. But at the same time, that we interview a cross-sectional people, which is what I think the suggestion is all being yeah. made here that can inform in an informative way uh, whatever is the guidance that's needed. And I would be just as happy, for example, in seeing Compassion of World Farming coming in here as I will uh, seeing the British uh, Aid Foundation or whatever. You know, I mean, it, it's important that there is a sensible balance in, in whatever happens in trying to derive this. But it might also be good that you get somebody from uh, Bristol University's welfare unit or one of the independent uh, uh, bodies in, in this sort of subject. I mean, I've, I put this uh, uh, past a colleague of mine who worked purely on the poultry side and asked him for his comments and said, if you were refereeing this as a paper, which is what would normally happen, what are your comments? I'm going to say that his comments were, shall we say, to the point on occasion. But I think that's the important point here, that it's got to pass scrutiny to go ahead, to be recommended and to be used as basis for the policy. That's important. Chair, that certainly throws up a question about what a task and finish group is about. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. You know, it, it really absolutely. does. And that's perhaps for another time. But just to say that I think we are all too aware of our shortcomings or lack of that experience. And that's why we are specifically at one point asking for further research that we really push that out and say, we know that's what's needed. We can't do it, but we are aware. Uh, and that would support Peter's, uh, Councillor Jim's point. Uh, I think that yes, there is a lot to be done and maybe some of it's out there already, but that needs to be done. That that's connection with the potential researchers and picking up what could and should be doing. Well, yes, but of course, this is a filtering process, doesn't it? The task and finish comes to the, the scrutiny committee. We're scrutinising the task and finish report and recommendations. We're making amendments and whatever, whatever. And we will then pass that up to the executive. The executive themselves can make a, a different determination. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, a kind of, it's a triaging process. There's no point in mm -hmm. an absolute. Um, but it makes sense for, for us as a committee to get the report and recommendations in the best you know, that's all that you can, yeah. uh, and that we are broadly content with uh, for, for us to progress it up. Uh, and that's what I think we're trying to get to here, hopefully. Um, so 5.3, interesting idea that um, but basically health impact should be considered within supplementary planning guidance. That's, I think that's an interesting idea. How do you, how do you measure it? Well, I think we, we, well, we have, you know, I mean, there, there are always, Things aren't there anyway that we would have in decisions and things that you should take account of, you know. So maybe we would just simply ask our partners in healthcare, here's the thing we're doing, have you got any comment? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, 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 I think that it makes sense. It makes sense to me to, to try to work in conjunction with, uh, with, with, our, with our partners in healthcare to, so, so that they're cited on what we're doing and they might have a, a point of view that probably 
in, in some ways, it's no different than the many consultations that occur in a planning, uh, you know, application to to historic England or, or yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. highways are usually yeah. a bit more specific. But but you know, where we 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 have no comment. We have no comment. They're so not saying that it's yes. one one way or the other. They're saying on this we have no comment. No comment. But but the question's there. And yes, like, exactly. You've asked the question, and if on any particular application. There might be something they want to comment then yeah. there is the opportunity yeah. and then what planning to do with that is that is then up to them and, and dr harry wants to come in at this point dr harry thanks very much can you hear me yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, it was just on the point of the health impact assessment specifically, although there are a couple of other points um, that I might want to, if possible, inject. Um, so in terms of health impact assessment and the SPD, that was to build on some work that I led in Worcestershire, which I think landed very well. Um, and that really helped in terms of people putting in applications to consider health impact before uh, the application comes in. And we had a toolkit and it's something that's been fairly well rehearsed in other areas and offered training for planners as well. So I think it's not sort of as simple as a letter to a health authority. It's about preparing a health impact assessment toolkit, which we roll out in, in a fairly robust fashion. Um, and certainly we were cited as, as nationally as good practice by the um, Town Planning Association in the work that we did there. So that was the advice that we were giving to members, which led to this particular recommendation. And then I wondered if I might just pick up a couple of other points, Chair, would that be possible? It would, please carry on. Thank you. Um, so one point is that we relied very heavily on this outdated Health Protection Agency um, evidence uh, to reassure members. Um, we did follow that up, you know, there was correspondence. Um, it wasn't about saying, oh, that's the last one, you know, well, well, we'll do that. We have followed it up and sought to understand who's doing what in the field. Now it would be the UCSA, United Kingdom um, Health Security Agency. And I'm pleased to report that actually still in touch and in the last week um, heard that they are now working on updating this guidance and as you've hinted here uh, there is this particular concern about potential cumulative impact um, but we certainly will be able to have some updated evidence sooner rather than later that work has been triggered as councillor jim quite rightly says you know that work is is work that is done to the expert national standards of uxa so that is systematic reviews that's critical appraisal you know that is something which is of a different scale which are obviously methods that we're very familiar with but um, don't have the capacity to do within a very very small uh, local authority team so we would be guided entirely by UXA who are our national expert authority and they are doing that work. I also just wanted to pick up, if I may, that point um, that came in, I think, from Councillor Summers um, about respiratory conditions um, increasing, a sort of um, comment that was made there. Um, just again to reassure members and perhaps remind members of the Task and Finish group um, that I worked with uh, colleagues in primary care and we trawled through um, recent years of data for conditions that could reasonably, reasonably be associated with increased particulate matter. And we looked to see whether there was a, any evidence of what would be at best correlation, but we looked to see if there was any pattern of increase where we had the proliferation of units in recent years. Um, and again, we, we satisfied ourselves that, that there weren't. Um, so there was that link was not there, that even a correlation of the of the weakest sort was not there. Um, then another point um, to make was about the uh, mental health um, issue. Uh, I think, you know, it's been great to hear um, members discuss the concerns about, again, there is this heavy anecdotal evidence from 64 respondents um, and draw your attention. Some of those people don't live anywhere near a farm, but experience stress because they're, well, they experience stress because they're worried about what happens in farms, which are not, they're not close to them, but, and, and I believe them. And I suppose the point I wanted to make, we tried in the group to make the distinction between mental illness and 
general well-being. Um, and we also try to show the respect um, that we show for people in the mental health system, which is that you are an expert by experience. Your experience is real. So I think that's why these views were given the prominence they were given, that those are true for those people. Our duty as Councillor Jimman would say, is, you know, quite correctly, is to put that into the statistical context of the county. So we are not talking here about an increased mental health burden for the county. Um, so to make that point. Um, so then I think the final thing is really just to sort of reiterate where we've all got to, that what we know from the poultry industry um, is that it does increase um, bioaerosols, the ammonia, particulate matter, are things that are um, can be harm, harmful to human health. However, as the Health Protection Industry uh, Agency concluded all those years ago, provided this industry complies with modern regulatory requirements, they're unlikely to cause serious or lasting ill health in local communities. We've got those dispersal effects. Um, so I think, I hope that's helpful. Um, and I must say, I do like Councillor Jimman's, you know, I've learned about air sacs in birds, which is very helpful. And I, I must say, I was interested in that as an alternative uh, route to compliance and testing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Howard. It's really helpful. Thank you. Councillor Jimman. Uh, thank you very much. May, may, may I just come back on one question? I was intrigued that you'd said that you'd put health impact assessments and you've been part of a group that had formed that and got it instituted. Can I ask you if that was One Health or just Human Health? That was Human Health. Yes, no, I mean, it does strike me that you're missing the, uh, the other aspects of that, yep. which is animal health and environmental health, which today I think we would all wish to see in any impact assessment. Um, I would urge uh, from yes, uh, environmental health would be there. Right. Yeah, environmental health and animal health should be part of any impact assessment taking it forward. And Thank so, you. something which I would appreciate. You might also like um, just to have a look at I can find it International Journal of Hygiene and Environmental Health 221 2018 134 to 173. A systematic review of public health risks of bioaerosols for intensive farming. Uh, Philippa Douglas, Sarah Roberts, Coon, etc. It's quite an interesting article because they do pull together all of the previous reports from I think it's about 1960s up to 2018 using PubMed and Scopus. And that uh, they do then find 38 health studies for inclusion. Which still comes, which still points out that there is a concern, and I think you're quite right that we need to be looking at cumulative uh, <coughs> questions. But it's talking an intensive farming on on childhood respiratory health, based on a small number of studies using self-reported outcomes. So we've got the qualifications coming in, but supported by findings from occupational studies. Further research is needed to measure and monitor exposure in community settings and re relate this to objectively measured health outcomes. So even after that amount of systematic review, the, 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 the very point the Task and Finish Group has made is that the, there is not the quality research there uh, really to, to take this through, which is important. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think, I think it is good. It's important to note that the task and finish group, you know, with, without those sort of resources, has, has come to exactly the right conclusion. There's an enormous gap in, uh, in knowledge here. Um, so can we just make a note that that bullet point on uh, 5.3, uh, second bullet point, because I think this is such an exciting idea that the health impact assessment is one health. Uh, that, that, thank you so much for that. Really, that feels like that's moving forward. In a, in, a, in a really constructive way, so thanks for that. Um, do you have any other comments? So, Cats for summons. I'd really like to thank the doctor for the work on the, with the planning and health. Mm. One of the biggest issues I think we've had in, in, in Herefordshire with planning is health is already in the planning uh, mandate. There should be checking 
for health. They should be checking with health resources on any planning application, which hasn't been happening as far as I'm concerned. I have mentioned this to Kevin Bishop a couple of times, but I'd like to see this. I'm, I like I like what I'm seeing there, but making sure that it is included in planning the health period. You know, it's, not, it's already in there. It don't have to make anything new. It's already in place. But why aren't we using it? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think that, that that change to bullet point two strengthens and strengthens, widens, deepens everything in a really meaningful way. Um, so, bullet point three, the IPU permit question. Um, that I oh, took for me to be speaking, there is not who's doing but that whoever is doing it so it does it. it. <laughs> so for me, I in a perfect world we might like to bring it in house, but it seems to me even in an imperfect world we could expect that the regulator would regulate it. So I would okay, so can, we, can, can we accept this as an action for the for the executive to consider that they follow up with the EA. Um, to, so that we understand what their monitoring regime is, yeah. especially in the light of our now understanding that they are getting, uh, you know, yeah, enough time to do yeah, 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 okay. from so, so these so actual people. So, bullet point three now action for, for the uh, executive to, to communicate with EA for the monitoring. Um, and is that potentially where there would be? Um, an extension of that to to try to capture the idea of um, in individual farmers um, mon doing voluntary monitoring or having a code of practice for monitoring. We start a conversation with the industry about it. But we ask the executive to, to, to start a conversation with the industry about it. Well, I, you yeah, know, I, in the end of the day, I think it, it benefits everybody to, to know what's going on, and including, including the crowds. I don't think there's any problem with that suggesting that there should be a dialogue around that. Oh, one of the yeah. problems you've come up against is the complexity of measuring. Mm -hmm. uh, so measuring within the building, so only it's already mentioned, the particulates are controlled in these modern poultry houses, as is the temperature, the lighting, everything else. Um, moisture content so externally some of those are quite difficult and then you've got to define at what distance and then what standards relate to as, as we can't determine what causes a problem is it at 100 meters is it 200 meters at what level of well, this, this, is, this is this is the discussion just, yeah exactly so this is the recommendation simply that we ask the, the executive to start that process to have that conversation and then you know we up to the industry to set that standard or to say technically it's not and feasible it's, and it um, might be something the lga because it might be something that would need to be done on a national basis not locally i'm very mindful of the comment that's just been made made about the small size of manpower uh, that we, we've got to be careful here what we're burdening yeah. ourselves with at the end of the day. But again, this is, this is sort of, you know, where, where, where the, the, you know, it's a conversation with the industry and the industry might say, yeah, we can take that on board for them. Unless somebody asks for them there. Um, the, um, but it's point four, I think is out of scope for me. Yeah, the adoption of a county-wide waste manure management yeah. strategy. I don't see scope. So, Really, quite well. How that would work, to be fair, and it's kind of stuff going on elsewhere. <laughs> but doesn't that pin down a major part of the problem we've got anyway? Which is, oh, sorry. which is, you know, that the very broadly speaking, we understand that, you know, that is the problem. That there is enough nitrate, phosphate, you name it, in the soil already for many, many years to, to come. And that any additional is going to add to the problems we've got in, in every respect, water and, and, and everything else. Surely that's absolutely key, is that we have some sort of management. Yeah, but the, but the task to finish is human health. <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, where do we start? I mean, again, it's a little bit like that other point. You know, I would be happy to see that and note it and have it as a kind of yes, that's a yeah, good idea. Yeah. But I don't think it's a, an yeah, evidence okay, fair uh, recommendation for yeah. this particular task. Mm -hmm. and it sits awkwardly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't we don't lose it. Well, maybe. Yeah. So, if we could have that as a. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think last scrutiny training we have been suggested that some things could be done as observation. Yeah, it could be a, something that isn't a recommendation. Right. Come back briefly. Yeah. Uh, councillors are aware there are there is discussion at the moment about having a commission, whatever you want to call it, uh, possibly a cabinet one looking into uh, phosphate pollution. It seems to me that that's the yeah. right place to place that. Yeah. Uh, yes, let's not lose it. It's an important point. It comes back to another aspect. Um, I wouldn't like to think that anybody viewing this today would think for one moment that we're going to pass any of these items over. It's more a question of how we deal yeah. with them and adopt them. Yeah. yeah. So it's getting into the right place so that they can yeah, be heard from you uh, and being aware. So, okay, 5.4. The executive lobbies DEFRA about the need for the Environment Agency to review the best available techniques now available for IP pollution abatement equipment. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's, de there's definitely something about working both with, with the EA or with the industry about best available techniques. And, and what role we play uh, in the planning authority. And I think so. I think that's the recommendation for me is that we work constructively with the EA and the industry over ensuring best available techniques um, and, and innovation. Let's be innovators because we were having that conversation about the moss uh, mm -hmm. thing you do, isn't that they like uh, particulate matter and they like ammonia? I think, well, I know there's lots of that. So, uh, you know, let, let's be innovators. And I think that, that that's what I would like that to capture. It doesn't quite capture it. Well, the example of that is that uh, people are now capturing the ammonia and converting it back into fertilizer and also converting it into um, fuel. So the mm. whole thing that, of the cycle here of using outputs for a positive purpose. And yeah, so I think it's, yes, it's, is, the door is open on yeah, that. The absolutely. discussion is there. Yeah. So, so for me, it's an opportunity it. that we yeah. ask the executive to engage with the environment agency, the industry, um, uh, to, 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 and, and, and our role of, as local planning authority to lead, innovate, mm -hmm. improve, uh, etc. Yeah, we can go to the health and safety executive. I don't think we could mention our own approach to domestic waste, which is clear at waste. And yeah. indeed, yeah, you know, so it's, it's a long thing it with led yeah. with to yeah. look at this and go, Look, yeah. oh, this phosphate is valuable stuff, this ammonia is valuable stuff. All, this is all doable, it just yeah. needs to be done. Um, Health and safety executive, I'm not sure we need to talk to do that. That's, I, I'm not against it, but health and safety executive have got very recent advice on it. So it seems to me that they are paying attention um, and would be ensuring the health and well-being of workers within the industry. So I think it was slightly it, outside our scope. We, we yes, yeah, scope it had feels a workers. little bit patronised. Yeah, so I, I would consider that's a sort of unnecessary or, you know, again, we, we might note it. In my feeling, unless anyone's got any strong feelings about HSC. Does, does it come back to the whole whole business of good practice, you know, at its best? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, That's exactly. Really so it's, it's sort of, do we need to just say good practice? This would be good practice, but we have to assume competence in the HSE. Um, um, yes. You know, <laughs> they have got guidance. I'm not very really keen on assuming confidence i'm sorry to say in any of these well um, it's just we did specifically but that's scope had the health of workers in the yeah, in yeah. industry yeah. so and it, and it makes work for us it's making work for us for, for the council to to talk to the health and safety executive to try and get this down to what we need to do rather than stuff that would be nice um the next and, one is and the next one again is outside 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 is out of scope. scope it can go to the phosphate commission as well Why is Fire, 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 yeah. Um, okay, good. Moving on, 5.5 independent research that the executive shares the support with a view to working jointly with local mm -hmm. university. Uh, what is interesting here is that we've just had a verbal update uh, from Dr. Howie. This has been overtaken by events, it would appear, that were so on the ball that Uxa. Have intuited what we've written as it should cancel. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> so, yeah. and I think what, whatever we do, it has to be reframed to take account of 
of, of that development. Uh, is that is that right, Dr. Harry? We, we kind of yeah. So that that would be. I think the, the the thought behind it is absolutely right. Is calling for more uh, up to date evidence. But if that support and assist, it, it, it's yeah, you know exactly. That's a good thing. Absolutely. You know, we can we can this can be actually the work that has been done already on this can support their work. So maybe what we should be doing is reaching out to UXO and saying, we've does, done this work, would you like to, to, to have sight of it? Would you like to know what's going on? And it does say work jointly with, so, yeah. you know, it's sort of pointing that So, so I'm, I'm happy with that, but I think it just needs to update and if Dr. Harry could coordinate with uh, Mr. Ball, Mr. Carter, uh, to no, we get that information in and we can... Get it completely. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a bit concerned here because it says quite clearly we're going to share this report. Now we've already some of us have already said that we are not happy with the, well, happy with the report. Yeah, with the report. Well, can we can we just bracket that because the, the report would have to be in the yeah so yeah okay point point taken. But I think we're going to look at the report in the gap between meetings and try and have a, a draft of it that we're happy with and we, we, we would be happy to share with uh, these Because if there are bits of bad it. science and, and then it so kind so of undermines our credibility okay. and what's the point of sharing it? Yeah, yeah, share so, that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we're assuming that we're going to be sharing the version of the report that this committee has approved and adopted. Yeah, it's joyful about it. Okay, thank you, Gats. Summers? Yeah, can we keep in mind that we have one of the biggest agriculture co colleges in Herefordshire, Herefordshire, Shropshire, and Ludlow, and we should be communicating with them, on, on, with their students on this, some of this. Thank you. Yes, I think it's a general point. We should, we should be uh, working with them a lot more. Um, okay, so by air pollution sampling tests or an IPU and control locations, we have evidence of high levels of West zoonotic disease near IPU sites. So, yeah, again, that's a sort of a a subset of this idea of monitoring, um, which makes sense to me. I mean, well, I know, really. UK HSA. The UK HSA is further work on this, which we've just been um, made aware of, is fundamentally they're looking, the outcomes from that will be dictating some of these particular points. In yeah. other words, you don't want to be spending money doing things that are not right in the, or doing it in the wrong way. Uh, so hopefully the outcome of the research we will have uh, sight of. And I suggest that this is rather than showing the report, it's actually saying that as a, as a result of a task in finish group, we are very conscious of the particular aspects that UKHSA is now working on and would like to work with them yeah. assist them mm. so that uh, in any work they're doing to get a report as a consequence. Mm. It's almost another section that needs to be aligned. Mm. Yeah. And, and yeah. the position we're in as one of the biggest, you know, mm. I, th I think we should definitely be reaching out. It's yeah. relevant, uh, not like all the other counties we are specifically. Yeah, um, we're well placed. We should be reaching out, and we've got the contacts. We've got this piece of work already, you know, to to, to say, look, you know, come and talk to us, um, and that might help this set of recommendations to just we'll make make more sense in the light of the work that's being done externally to us, so that we're not going over the same ground, which would be silly. But it also is a point of discussion with them, saying these are the things that we would be looking at. So I think that would be really useful to get that as, as just a recommendation yeah. that all these things... The problem is you get against <laughs> counties, private water supplies and wells potentially. So, you know, we're not doing two things again. Can we come back to, unless you're suggesting actually do salmonella testing, um, which no, would be human I'm, health, but yeah, I don't think okay. that was ever in your minds, was it? No. I mean, yeah, some of this comment. Mark. That's new. Oh, I was going to say, sorry. Did you want me to come in? Sorry. Um, we do do private water supply sampling and we look for things like TPC, total viable counts, E. coli, coliforms. Um, I mean, it's well documented that where there's areas of agricultural activity, you tend to get more fails, um, particularly if I suppose private water supplies are quite shallow, like wells or, or not very well protected boreholes. 
Um, mm. But we are doing that. We have a staff statutory duty to undertake samples. So, you know, that being in there actually just says that we're doing it already. And we know that it's not just IPUs, but, you know, cattle activity or anything like that. Mm. Okay. Some spies will cause problems, which is why we usually have chlorination or UV lights etc on on high water supplies and serve notices to require it where they're commercial so in effect the point is that that's a statutory responsibility mm -hmm. under yeah. drinking water directives and so on yeah so it's happening <clears throat> so we don't really need that as a recommendation and, 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 the, 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 and the, the, the third Point I, I'm, I'm taking that that would be the point of the research anyway. So, so possibly not. Any linkage is really good. The next bullet point, which is about updating, has been overtaken by events. We could support, but and, so and it needs support. it needs reframing in the light of that, doesn't it? Yeah. Again, it'd be one for Dr. Harry to input there. Uh, and ditto the, the, the next bullet point, I think. It's so helpful that they're doing that as well. Yeah. Is everyone okay with, with that? 5.5, those changes and suggested amendments, okay. 5.6, mental health awareness. So again, this is a recommendation from the task committee to the scrutiny committee, and for us, it's a recommendation from the scrutiny committee to the executive that we provide that, that we ask the, the executive to consider providing primary care services with a thematic summary of the responses of the group that the group received on the subject from the public, um, and, and 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 with a kind of extrapolation from those responses. Um, Anyone got any comments on that? Yes. Councillor Jinman. Yeah, I'm afraid I get slightly touchy when I read mental health issues because that means there's been a diagnosis of mental health uh, concern. I think what we're trying to do here is not to record concerns that are raised. And there may be anxiety, maybe concern. The word stress has uh, was difficult because it has connotations beyond um, purely anxiety or concern. I dislike that smell. I dislike that noise. Doesn't mean that you have mental stress to the level that you can really seek treatment. So it's a question of how you phrase that so as not so that we collect the right data in the right way at the right level that we're not creating an added concern, and I would put it that way, uh, for the medical profession uh, to deal with. Can I make the suggestion that the recommendation is simply shortened and finishes at the word public? Yeah. Uh, and could I make the point that what we were looking at was human health and well-being? We weren't looking at human health and diagnosed mental illness. Mm. So I think we are entitled to say that many of these things mm. quite clearly did impinge on people's well-being. I'm happy to accept that they didn't lead to a diagnosis. We just need to get ourselves, you know, lined up and ducks in a row. Yeah, on, no, on, I mean, on I the, think the, point, the point for me is that uh, members of the public took time to, to, yeah. to record so, their, their, yeah. their feelings mm. and experiences mm. and whatever. And, and this is about passing that information Absolutely. on That's in a meaningful way. Now, I don't think we need to speak for those members of the public, they, they, they were very, I think, uh, articulate themselves. So we don't need to tell uh, anyone what they told us. You can just send the information and say, this is what we have learned uh, from these people. You might want to read it. And um, the primary head. So services so can then make their own conclusion. Precisely. So that's that's all I think we, but, you know, I don't think we need to dot the I's and cross the T's and put a neon white around our thing. You know, the, 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 the level of our articulacy of the letters that we received from the streets with South Yeah. So we all have to just oh, finish that recommendation at, at the word comment. Oh, yes. Also keeping in mind that stress and anxiety might cause mental health, but mental health doesn't normally cause stress and anxiety. 
It can do, but it's not. And, and we also need to keep in mind that most of us at some time during the day suffer some form of stress or I'm going to drive, drive out of here, America, <laughs> yeah. back home. I'm definitely at some stage going to have some stress yeah. and anxiety. And, and if it's constantly, <clears> every, actually, it's quite good for you, then it's going to cause mental health, but otherwise it won't. Okay, so can we move on then to 5.7, publicising the report that the Health Care and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee request the report be published under separate cover. What does that mean? Separate cover. Sure. Se <laughs> separate from the from, from other well, anyway. <laughs> he published. Um pilot that's been undertaken by the group to so to publish to the local community. I think the point we wanted was that this wasn't going to be put on a shelf. We want this to be shared for people to know that we have looked at this and that you have considered it and that you know whatever decisions are made are made. So it yeah. simply doesn't go on with the radar. I think that's our main point. And then the last bit is that we actually come back and get some feedback <coughs> on what's happened afterwards. Uh, separate cover, I'm afraid I should do, but I don't know. Don't what I, mean. um, I think we're going to struggle to revisit in six months' time due to the pressure of yeah. work, and yeah. that's not our undertaking. But I think perhaps at some point, I think we'd appreciate you know, that. Uh, yeah, so just keep it on the yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, the feeling is that sometimes these things do I'm happy with that. I'm not sure about publishing. I mean, I think it's, 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 on, the, it's, it's on the website. It's, it's, it's available. Yes. So, so that, you know, I think it would be up to individual individuals and members of work. Yeah. You know, if you if you know somebody's interested in the subject, you can. I think it's what happens to it that people will also be interested in. You know, this is this is what we produce. This yeah. is what you're considering. But yeah, what mm. is the outcome? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to probably hang fire on that. To so start, we have to agree the report to go, but I'm not really sure that because it it then it elevates it or makes it different from every other task and finish report we've ever done. And then that says something that mm. well, we're not really it's... trying to say. So <laughs> I think uh, I don't know, but I do, but I'm comfortable that it will yeah, it will be published. It will be on. Is yeah. it possible to say that you will? Come back in a year or something. Yeah, yes. I'm probably, I think I'm, we'd like I'm, to know what's going on. Basically, the work program is set by the committee. The committee wants to have another uh, jog around. I mean, maybe in the, it, it may be that the UXA uh, work is going to mm. produce something that will be revelatory. And who knows? It could come like under customs. another heading down the road. It could, you know, there's lots of stuff that we're going to be looking at in the future. I mean, I'm, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not ruling it out. No. I'm, just, I'm just saying the work but, program is. is yeah, it could be part of something for six else. months, and, and then you know everything's <coughs> changed, <laughs> and, or not. Who knows? <laughs> I think we put it on the kind of you know. Yeah, I think what you agree with each other. All sorts of questions. You'll have executive response to task and yeah. group report in due course, so that will be reported back to the committee. So that's another opportunity mm -hmm. to, to consider if there's any further work or, or pro work program you need to do. Is that the yeah. subject is very important. That's the point. In this county, this subject is very important. Mm. And it's right that we therefore keep a watchful eye on the subject. Of course, it has that relevance. I think that's, I think that's yeah. what you're seeking, and I would wholeheartedly support that. Right, brilliant. Um, so I think that the, the, the other recommendations were. Uh, as noted as we passed along, I think about um, Chair, could I ask what's one of our recommendations that to take up Councillor Jinman's kind office to help um home? I mean, I'd certainly I certainly don't agree with your recommendation, is it? Well, well I mean, there, or, yes. Yes. there was a recommendation that it's going to be. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, that's that's true. True. <laughs> there is a recommendation. Is the it, is, it is tied up. <laughs> and I'm just saying that. Yeah, yeah. very happy. That's it. We're not, we're, not, we're, we're not in a position to uh, accept the report today. No. So, sometime yeah. between this meeting and the next meeting, it needs to. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think it would be. Um, so I want to democratically to correct to actually say that it's Councillor Jimman that's going to tidy up this report because no. it then becomes 
Councillor Jimbin's report. No, but we will get to have another look at it in yeah, September. Yeah, I think to, if, to, if to go. Mean, I was very clear. I said I will assist. Yes, yeah. I think yeah. to say that you're yeah. going to yeah. read look at the report you. and no, try no, to make. But it's enough to identify <coughs> those phrases yes. and words and the specific areas that hopefully we can. Uh, I think we well, yeah, and get to, to, yeah. to just. Yeah. The language okay. will be the group's language. Yeah, exactly. I am nearly yeah. going to contest. Talk through. <coughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'd be very happy to indulge in this prolonged and <laughs> deal with Councillor Jim. <laughs> to work collaboratively with. Work work collaboratively with the exact words. Words. Exact words. Words. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have, you know, the fighting metaphor earlier. <laughs> so talk about yourselves. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, look, I'm hopeful that we can get to the yes, because, so, because at the end of the day, I mean, I think what the important the message is that we, we, you know, there's stuff that we don't know because we don't know stuff. So, just making sure that that, that, that you have an university in place is going to scare us things. You find something wrong, and there's something to be doing. Yeah, yeah. 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 the only other thing that was kind of rolling about right in my head is a potential thing, you know. I want to go down the appointment. That's okay. okay. Right. But thank you for taking the advice. See you again soon. Um, with whether or not there are specifics within either the SPD or planning generally, you know, to consider, I, I don't know, uh, distances, for instance, to residential privileges mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, not really easy, isn't it? No. It's not the ones. No. I remember there was one that was 50 metres to yeah. the next domestic privilege. Uh, <laughs> I think that is what it is, isn't it? I thought it was mentioned. There's a recommendation. Minimum distances in planning. We're having a discussion about minimum distances to residential curtilages. Is there such a is there a minimum distance to residential curtilages where there's an IPU? I think I don't know if it's meters. Mark Windus. Yeah, Do you want me to come in? Yeah. So there used to be a 400 meter rule, didn't there, for planning, uh, but the 400 meter rule um, disappeared. So there is no minimum distance, as I understand it. However, each permit will have a condition that says there should be no offensive odor beyond the site boundary. And likewise, there should be no deposition of dust or other nuisance, etc. So it's again, it's the distance sufficient to the, the state of the art, as Councillor Jimman said earlier on. The newer units are a lot better at dispersing directly upwards at a high flux velocity, so they're less likely to cause problems to the, to the older one. But there is no distances, it all depends. Yeah, on the, given that nobody actually monitors uh, over dispersal, um, would it be a reasonable recommendation to suggest that the executive consider? Reinstating um, a minimum distance, unless there is a specific reason to delegate that. Is, is that a question to me? Because that's obviously a question yeah. to me. For my part, I think the government would be unlikely to accept something on distance because it depends on so many different factors. Um, I suppose it comes down to the requirement. You know, if there's monitoring. And that was a requirement of permits and you'd know whether or not they perform or not if they don't perform then they, you can scrub out you know particular out of even you know a high sort of velocity outlet you can scrub it it just adds to cost of operation well, i thought we'd all agree that there is not really enough monitoring yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. crazy question does it affect so, the also I, I don't know i mean i'm just saying it's, it's not i'm not you know this isn't we don't decide this and then you know this is so that's kind of crazy. Make it so. 
Big it's point. just a suggestion for the a recommendation. Being made is it would have to be a national standard. Yeah. I'm understanding from what Marx has said. If it's got to be a national standard. Is that right, Mark? Are you saying it would yeah. have a national standard? Why, used to why, be, can't, why can't we have it in RSPD? As well, there used to be. Yeah, the use used, used to be uh, what was it? Uh, uh, policy number seven adopted by many councils, saying 400 meter, and people used to say the 400 meter rule every time the poultry shed was talked of. That disappeared, and now it all depends on the modelling, etc. Which is why some of them are close to the 400 meters. It made it easy for planning, as you just drew circles around. The difficulty then, of course, um, councillors, is that when you've got cumulative impact and you start drawing circles around many of them. They tend to overlap, and uh, that's why I suppose the odor assessment is done now by modelling. But you know, there's nothing better than real monitoring to tell you what levels, you know, actually are where receptors are, you know, where people are, and that's probably the best way forward. I don't think you're going to get a uh, distance and zoning distance. There's too many variables. But, we get, but it, 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 I would have thought an, an SPD. Well, we've got one in the pipeline, haven't we? The SPD is planning guidance. It's not. Uh, sacrosanct, but it, this might not be silly at this point to ask the, the executive to consider a minimum distance guidance within the SPD. It, it could be considered because it's SPD supplementary guidance. planning guidance and it has to comply with national guidance and, F, and NFP. Well, they, they can always turn it down. I think, you know, but I don't. You know, it, I, it, it, it seems to me it's not, we, it used to be what, what was there. I think there, I mean, there's an interesting anomaly in um, uh, the 28 day rule, isn't it? That if you're putting up a shed to keep your tractor in, crack on, but if your sheep might wander into it, you need full planning permission. Well, why would that be? It's because there's a potential impact of having livestock in that shed, and that's within 450 metres. So, logically, there is a difference. Mm. Amazing. I'm not going to argue with Alyssa on that one. No, it's, it's, up to, it's up to yourselves to decide. I'm here just to advise. Has anyone, has anyone got an anti view of, of, of whether or not that might be a recommendation that we could fashion into that? There's no reason why. There's no reason why. Really reason you can't put it in. in. No, the exec can make the decision as to whether they yeah, exactly. put it through right. or not. Okay, yeah. brilliant. <clears throat> Right, so I'm running out of things to say now. Has anybody I'm else got any good. additional? <laughs> or and and do any uh, any attending officers wish to comment before we get get the recommendation? No. Okay, marvellous. This is what we're going to do then. Yes, Jess. So just to clarify, um, <laughs> what your intention is. Your your intention is to bring back the reports. Yes. Um, to the next meeting, subject to some final consultation with the task group and members of this committee. Um, so you're not going to agree with the report or recommendations today. And to ask the task group to review in light of your uh, steer, bring back to the next meeting. Uh, do you want me to read this out? Or do you... right, so, on behalf of the chair, it's moved that the scrutiny task and finish group review the draft scrutiny reports and recommendations in consultation with members of the committee and interim statutory scrutiny officer, taking into account the views and suggested provisions made by the committee and present this back to the health care wellbeing scrutiny committee at this next meeting. Thank you. All in favour, please show. Thank you. Right, so, um, moving swiftly on. Number nine, data future, future meetings. Um, which I guess is to be noted. Yeah. September is on next. Please give my apologies. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. So, right, thank you all uh, very much. Can I please check with Democratic Services that the live stream has been switched off?
Lovely. I'm glad I'm not having chicken tea. Right off the idea. I don't know. Chicken tea.